morning, everybody. Hey. So as the, the colonel, you all know his background, right? I was just saying, in case you didn't know, you got drafted into the mental health business. You all signed up to be teachers, right? Teach calculus and AP history and all that kind of stuff. And lo and behold, you're in the mental health business, like it or not. So that's the way the draft works. We're here this morning to try to give you some tools to help you deal with what you got drafted into. Um, because it turns out that all apologies to AP history and so forth, it's the mental health part of what you guys do for these kids that is the critical piece. Now you may not believe that now, but I'm gonna take a good shot at trying to convince you of that by the end of today. And before we get, oh, special shout out by the way to the teacher's assistants. I know you guys all are in the trenches. My wife is a teaching assistant in the ES classroom at Council Rock. She's also the president of her union. And she's really, uh, her whole thing is about respect for the support staff. And one of the guys, her vice presidents, the other night was saying to me, yeah, they all talk about school security. Said, so God forbid, if somebody comes in the door with a gun, who do they hit first? It's the support staff. When a kid freaks out in the classroom, who do they go after first? Who has to jump in first? So special shout out to you guys. Thanks for being here. And hopefully give you a couple of tools that will help you with your work. And I need to learn some more about you in terms of uh, in the service, we have stripes that tell you how long you've been in the business kind of thing. So how many folks here have their eldest child age 25 or over? All right, a lot of veterans. I may be calling on you to witness a few things. <laughs> eldest child 18 to 24. Very good. Eldest child 13 to 17. Well, that brings them out, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Anybody we didn't get to yet? You've got children that are below, uh, uh we got some newbies here. Oh no. <laughs> uh, should I tell them? Or you guys want to tell them? Or, uh, <laughs> If you want to leave, you know, it's fine. I'll get you the book. It's okay. There's sometimes you don't want to know what's coming down the road. All right. Well, I got a tip for you newbies anyway from the get-go. Be very careful of the parent karma thing. Do you know about that? See, raising kids up to adolescence, you know, it could be challenging. We had a special needs child ourselves, but it ain't nothing like adolescence. And nature kind of plays a trick on you. You get sucked into thinking everything's cool, right? You're kind of bumbling along. It's usually mom with a daughter. You're like six, seven, eight, nine, and you guys are best buddies. You know, you go out shopping together. Do you get the matching outfits? Have you been there yet? You know, and go out for the lunch, those little tea sandwiches and all that stuff. And you come home from one of those lunches with your best buddy young daughter, and there's your next door neighbor on her front yard with her 15-year-old daughter who is shrieking and cursing and throwing lawn, lawn ornaments at mom, saying curse words you never heard before, that kind of stuff. And you're tempted to think a thought you should not think. What's the thought you're tempted to think? Yeah, my daughter would never talk to me like that. No, nah, don't go there, don't, don't judge, say a prayer, light a candle, whatever your belief system is. Do not judge, because until you've walked in the shoes, you really don't know what it's like. So there's your first tip, beware of the karma. Um, one, of the, uh, one of my many uh, former misadventures in life, and we'll talk about that, the misadventures of kids are incredibly instructive and formative. Um, our mantra in working with kids is don't do no thing, do something, whatever it is. You want to manage a surf shop in California? Go for it. Uh, you want to join the military like I did? Go for it. Uh, the military did not work out for me. I figured there's better ways to make a living, but I learned a hell of a lot. It was incredibly formative for me. And being in the military kind of put a thing in my head that stays with me to this day. It's sort of like a club. And since that time, I work with veterans. When I became a psychologist, I went through a series of careers, finally figured out what I really wanted to do was help people. And working with veterans is one of the things I do to kind of put those two interests together. So I work with a VA with guys that, and when I say guys, we talk about males and females. So with folks that are coming back that had terrible injuries. So I sort of would deal with a number of folks who had something called traumatic amputee 
uh, where they would lose a limb, usually due to an explosion of some sort. And I got called in on one kid, two cases over about 18 months. The first case uh, was a guy who lost his right leg, and he predictably wouldn't get out of bed. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He isolated himself. Um, he refused to cooperate with treatment. Um, and he promised to kill himself on the first opportunity he could get because he was a tradesman and his life was over at this point. So that's kind of the way I think I would react if I had gone through that. Second guy, about 18 months later, I get another call from the VA. They said, we got another guy we'd like you to work with, another traumatic amputee, the other leg. And I said, let me guess, he won't get out of bed. They said, no, get this, we can't keep him in bed. We tell him do 10 reps, he does 30. Uh, we tell him that he's got to sleep more, he's having none of it. He roams the halls, he's formed these support groups for veterans, and whenever there's a new admittance, he would be up and greeting the new person coming in, saying, look, it's a brotherhood, sisterhood, we're gonna be okay, we're gonna get you through this, we're here for you. So, and they were afraid he was gonna hurt himself, literally. Oh, the biggest part was he was refusing a standard prosthetic device, you know, a standard false leg. He's having none of that, he wants a runner's prosthetic. You all know about that? Well, learning how to walk on a false leg is really hard. Learning how to run on a false leg, you know, oh my God, you have to do all this brain training sort of stuff, it's really difficult. So I go in to meet the guy, and he's like too busy to be talking to a shrink. So he's sort of dismissive and blah, blah, blah. And finally, he looks at me and he says, I know what you're thinking. I said, what am I thinking? He said, you're thinking I'm do doing this high on life, you know, rah, rah stuff to avoid feeling my pain. That's what you're thinking, ain't it? And I said, well, it crossed my mind. And he said, man, I feel the pain. Don't tell me I don't feel the pain. He said, I wake up in the middle of the night, pardon my French, but puking, from a pain in a leg, I don't have anymore. It's something called phantom pain that happens with these amputees. It's, it's really hideous. He said, I cry. He said, I, you know, I feel like I wish I wasn't alive at times, but God damn it, I'm not giving another inch of my life to that freaking war. I gave it a leg. It's not getting another inch. So if you want to help me, Dr. Bradley, you get the VA guy in here, because I want to hear about my benefits, I'm thinking about law school, and I want that runner's prosthetic. So, you have two individuals, same horrific injury, two very different responses. How does that happen? And this has sort of plagued us in this business for a while, because you would have units in combat that would go through things, and guys side by side would have essentially the same experience, the same horror, the same fear, the same stress, and one would seem to come home and say, well, that sucked, but you know, onto my next chapter, and the other would descend into depths and have a hell of a time coming back. And we were scratching our heads saying, what, what is going on here? What is the difference? Uh, the responses to these horrific stressors that these folks go through are really uh, predicated on excessive stress, right? Overwhelming stress, fear, uh, pain, deprivation, isolation, all that stuff which creates something called stress, and specifically excessive stress, and it's often labeled something called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and everybody's sort of familiar with that, right? You get this stuff on TV a lot. By the way, I call this condition a wound. You know, people say, well, he wasn't wounded, he's only got PTSD. No, he's wounded, and we now have the MRIs to show that, because this excessive stress to some brains, changes the brain. They're much like a, a traumatic brain injury, we can see their brains are not the same as when they first deployed. They are different. So I think it qualifies as a wound and it should be viewed that way, because that's what they're struggling with. So research has shown that these levels of stress literally rewire the brains of people in a way that bring on anxiety, depression, and suicidal thinking. But something else began to pop in the business of the, the folks working with these returning vets. They were finding that a lot of vets were coming back from, you know, a deployment means you get sent overseas, typically to a, not a very nice area, and often 
you, you have no family, you're sort of isolated, strange, stranger in a strange land sort of thing. And a lot of these folks are coming back and showing the same symptoms of anxiety, depression, suicidal thinking. Never heard a shot fired in anger. Never heard a shot fired in anger. So they may have been in bad places, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so forth, but they weren't involved in any firefights, and yet they had the identical symptoms. So we tried to figure out what was going on there, and what we discovered is that there's another form of stress brain damage, or PTSD, which occurs not from you know, the movie versions, the huge explosions, the monstrous firefight, and all that stuff, but from being in a terrible place, or a scary place, it's not home, day by day by day, walking the streets, maybe patrolling, driving, just looking out the window of the building, and seeing a lot of people that really don't want you there, and wondering if one of them is gonna kill you at some point, waiting for the bomb to go off, hearing the sirens, seeing the ambulances and the helicopters coming back with the wounded, drip, 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 and there's all the secondary stressors people forget about. If you've been in the military, you get it, but if you're deployed, your life changes substantially. You know, not being home is really hard, especially if you have family. If you're married, you have kids, you say goodbye for a year, it's, it's really, really hard. Financial stress, because you're not making the money anymore. Everybody, the whole family unit gets stressed. So there's all those secondary drip, drip, drip effects. Everybody got that? No bullets, no bombs, just people living in a really tough situation, worried, 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 often trying to manage things they can't manage. It's a common feeling when you're deployed in a foreign land. It's like, I can't change this. I'm just trying to survive, kind of being out of your depth, you know, hoping you hold it together till you get home. So we've come up with a second category of PTSD called complex type. And that refers to the drip, drip, drip. It can be several events of less spectacular stress, or it can just be that daily experience of living in an awful situation. So, um, we see this disorder in civilians as well, and you guys have seen it in your work. We used to call this the thousand yard stare. You just look at somebody and you can see in their eyes something's off, right? You know these kids. You've seen them, it's like something's off. If you do this for a few years, you start to get that instinct kind of a thing, that this kid is in trouble, something's going on. Why am I telling you about this? Because of the work you do, guys. Because amazingly, over the past couple of decades, that thousand yard stare that we see in veterans' eyes very often, I've been increasingly seeing in the eyes of the kids you work with, increasingly. And the comparison, some people get offended when I compare these, quote, entitled snowflake kids to re veterans returning from deployments. Well, you know, I've been both. And I'll tell you, when I look at the world that these kids live in, I'm pretty sure I would not have survived. I was Southwest Philadelphia. You know, half of my friends were, you know, wannabe gangsters and all like that. A couple, one is in jail, still for life, that kind of stuff. But when I compare my childhood experience to what I see going on in these kids' lives, I'm saying, man, there's no way. I just don't think I would make it. And the statistics back me up on that instinct. The rates of suffering between veterans returning from deployments and the kids you work with are very similar. Very similar. Uh, over the past five decades, the rates of uh, anxiety and depression have exploded among teenagers. They're up four to five hundred percent. And when I say that, I'm not saying we coddle them more or we're searching for it more. We're talking about real rigorous studies where we try to sort those factors out. This is the real deal. These kids are suffering exponentially more than most of us did as teenagers. And the killer statistic really sums it up. Um, 1952 is the year we first started to collect data on suicide. From 1952 to about two years ago, three years ago, 2016, the last big study, suicide in the general population increased 78%. So that alone is kind of interesting. Wow, like, you know, why do so many more people off themselves? Well, in the teenage population and young adults in that same time frame, 
instead of 78%, it's up 500%. 500%. So if you think these are kids that are just whining and trying to not have to do their homework, these are kids that kill themselves at an amazing rate. To the point where, stand in this hallway at the opening day in September or August, and click off every fifth kid, you have a child that in the past year either attempted suicide or had a serious plan to suicide. Serious plan means they don't want to be here anymore and they were going to take themselves out and they had thought of how they're going to do it. They came up with a method, they just didn't pull the trigger or get the pills together. Every fifth child, are you freaking kidding me? Do you remember kids talking about suicide depending on your age? I remember being in the park with my buddies and we were ferociously debating the meaning of the Blue Oyster Cult song, Don't Fear the Reaper. You all know that song, Punch It Up. You know, and somebody said, ah, oh, that's, that's about suicide, man. I said, suicide? Yeah, that's, that's stupid. Yeah, no, it's suicide. We had this big fight. And by the way, the guy who wrote that song still denies it's about suicide. Because I put it in the book and I had to call him up. Is it okay if I mention this? And he was mad. No, I'm going to sue you. You say it was about suicide. Listen to the words. He just didn't want the rap that he was sort of advocating suicide. Now, suicide is part and parcel of your kid's culture, right? Don't you hear them talking about it all the time? Every weekend, you know, it goes off. Every Monday, don't you get the stories about who was going to kill themselves that weekend? It's become this weird ritual. Kids try to save each other. They're up all night texting and you know, Instagramming and so forth. And uh, we lose these kids at an, at an amazing rate. So, what is the difference between those two vets? What is it that's going on in our adolescent young adult population today? It's the loss of something called resilience. The loss of resilience. Now, resilience is a tricky subject. I mean, we could do a week on it, but I'll give you the crash course. That ain't what people think. See, people think about resilience as, you know, that's the tough guy. You know, that's that Navy SEAL, you know, ice water in the veins, never gets upset, never afraid, you know, never feels pain, all that sort of stuff. They, they think of the old John Wayne movies, right? That that's resilience. Guys, that ain't resilience. You could call that toughness if you want to, but we can debate whether that's actually a good thing or not. That's usually something we put on to get through a really bad time. But most of us in the business say that's just not the way we're wired as human beings. The soldiers I knew, the best ones that I knew, would say, man, I was scared s -less. Yeah, I'm scared, but I got to do my job. But they would acknowledge the fear and perform in spite of it. So it ain't this act like nothing scares me. Uh, it's something different. Um, I define resilience not as that toughness, but rather as a set of skills that we use to cope with stress. It's skills and assets that we try to build in into folks to help them handle the stressors in life that are going to come at them. I don't know if you've noticed, life can be stressful. Anybody here notice that? Yeah, life can be tough. Stuff happens, falls out of the sky on you. Right, yeah. So how we respond to it is the key. Um, if you think of those two veterans that I described to you, think of them as small boats out on an ocean, right? And a huge wave overwhelms both boats. And they both go under. They take the hit. They're damaged. You know, they're like hanging on there. And one goes all the way down to the bottom. That's it. He's done. And the other goes down, takes the hit, but bounces back up to the surface and continues on its way. That's a good way to think about resilience. It's like emotional buoyancy. It's the ability to take the hit. Um, to feel the pain, like that second vet that I told you about. He ain't you know, lying about pain, and he ain't trying to pretend it away. He says, yeah, it hurts. It hurts a lot. This really, really sucks. But an ability to then bounce back, to say, all right, I can't do that. What can I do? How do I move forward? Um, this is not grit. You've heard the concept of grit. I think one of the Navy SEALs wrote a book about this, or Make Your Bed, and all that kind of stuff. That's different, guys. That's a whole different subject. And you know, there's stuff there that's valuable. Read those books. But what I'm talking about is different, because with resilience, 
I know that it is not a genetic, uh, genetically transmitted characteristic. Um, there's features of resilience that seem to appear in the genes, but primarily it's not, guys, where the grit thing seems to be more genetically based. Debate about that. So resilience is different. Resilience is a learned set of skills. It's a developmental process that we can all foster in our own kids and the kids that we work with in how we deal with them. And it's a, a building process that can begin on the way home from the hospital. No joke, after the delivery. It's a kind of a, a lifelong view of how to parent, how to teach, how to intervene with kids, especially with teenagers. Resilience is not a rare ability, guys. We can teach, we can train resilience in everybody. I used to work in the prisons, and we did this with the toughest of the toughest kids coming from zero assets, zero skill levels. You go to their level and you start to move them along. You find where they're at, and then you say, hey, how about this step, and the next step, and the next step. And we saw amazing things. I saw things I just couldn't get out of my head. It kind of got me into this whole, whole subject of resilience and trauma and so forth, that what these kids were able to do, particularly as teenagers. The older we get, the more difficult it is to change these patterns. But you guys have a magic window because teen brains, as we'll talk about in a minute, are going through this wild growth process, which means your interactions can be incredibly significant, much more so than you could ever imagine. So you guys are right at that critical point to, to making a difference. So to try to convince you of all this stuff, <clears throat> I'm going to do it in four parts. First, we're going to chat a little bit about the brains inside those teenagers' heads. Yes, parents, there is a brain inside your 13-year-old's head. Uh, no, it's not the brain you had hoped for. It's, it's a brain very much in process, and I think you'll find that part of the presentation interesting when we talk about that. But the, the bottom line is that a teen brain is a device built to be non-resilient. <laughs> It is an anti-resilience brain. We'll come back to that. Second, we're gonna chat about the world around these kids. And the world around these kids truly is crazy. You know, I joke about all my books, I have the word crazy in the title, yes, your teen is crazy and all that stuff. Well, the world truly qualifies for that title, guys. This is a world that's kind of gone off the tracks around our kids for a variety of reasons. And I, when we go over that part, particularly as parents, that's like white knuckle time when you hear what's going on out there. And it's hard to keep up on because it changes so quickly. If you think you know what it's like to be a teenager, those of you especially who are younger, do never say that to a teenager today because one, you'll lose them because they're gonna think you're gonna lecture to them about, you know, this is how you be a teen, forget that one. But the other is you're wrong. I'm sorry, I do this for a living. I spend my life reading research saying, holy smoke, it's all changed from last year. A whole new set of things. So when a kid says, you don't understand what it's like to be a teenager, as mom, dad, teachers, and so forth, your answer should be, you're absolutely correct. I have no idea. Tell me. Educate me. You're showing respect for the kid, for their world. If we dropped you in Liberia as a Peace Corps volunteer, would you walk in and say, hey, I got this, I know what you guys are dealing with. Well, you know, you'd be on the first boat home. You go in and you show respect for culture. Say, look, I don't know anything about this. Please educate me. Then people are open to sharing, to engaging with you. So show respect for their culture. It is not the one, trust me, that you remember. Uh, and then third, we'll try to get to the empowering part. Uh, where we're going to share some strategies and tactics. Uh, if the mission is resilience building, then we're going to have some strategies, things to do, kind of broad goals that you can do, and stuff to share with your parents uh, to help them in the work they're doing or use with your own kids. And then we have uh, some tactics, day to day, what do you do when sort of stuff, down and dirty response uh, paradigm stuff. And we'll give you that too. By the way, that, that's the handouts that you have. Feel free to uh, give those handouts out. Feel free to steal my stuff. 
I just stole it from somebody else. So, you know, if, if you're in school, just go ahead. It's true. Yeah, everybody does that in this business. I used to do a quote as part of my seminar saying, uh, you know, help yourself to my stuff. Because Emerson had a great quote, right? His quote was, originality is the art of concealing one's sources. <laughs> Isn't that a great quote? Well, I did this for about 10 years, and then an English teacher, I hate English teachers, she came up to me and she said, oh, I loved your seminar, but I'm sorry, it wasn't Emerson. I said, yes, it was, I looked it up. She said, no, nah, it's misattributed. I said, it was really Benjamin Franklin originated that quote. I looked it up. Emerson stole Franklin's quote <laughs> about originality. Isn't that great? So feel free. Print them up. You don't have to call me. Just hand them out. The more they get out there, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Then we'll get to the best part at the end, uh, which is q and A. I'm going to leave some time. I'll try to not talk too much, which is not an easy thing for me. However, we're going to do some questions and answers. q and A. By the way, a couple rules on q and A. I am Irish by birth, not by choice. In my family, q and A stands for quarrels and arguments. <laughs> So if you don't like what I'm saying and you think it's really dumb, please stand up and say that. It's helpful. Usually it means uh, I'm not speaking clearly or you know something I don't. Everywhere, I, I still do this at this ripe old age because everywhere I go, I get a nugget. Somebody says something, I say, that's really smart. I should have thought of that. And it sets me off on the next interest adventure. So please feel free to quarrel and argue. And by the way, contrary to the myth, there is such a thing as a dumb question. Do you all know what the dumb question is? What's the dumb question, teachers? It's the one you don't ask. Absolutely. Yeah, one you don't ask. If you have a question, I know other folks have the same question. And not all of us are brave enough to raise our hands. And uh, I don't know, maybe we'll try to run a microphone around in case you know some of you don't like shout. Well, you're teachers. You shout all the time. OK, never mind. Forget that. Um, yeah, ask the questions. If we don't get to your question today, write me. I do get back to those emails. And you know, don't let a question go unanswered. Do pursue this stuff. Oh, a couple of points of business. Um, first, we will take a break about midway through. I'll shoot for about 10.30, so nobody feel like uh, you're going to be stuck here forever. Um, second, uh, yes, this is the ugliest tie you've ever seen in your life. You guys have been really way too nice. Nobody commented on my tie. Anybody know these characters on the tie? Can you see it? Rocky and Bullwinkle. They, they still live, huh? Rocky and Bullwinkle, my heroes. What's the story? Well, my son is doing great. When he was you know, going through the dark days, you all know the 13-year-old dark days, right? It, my son used to think I was cool back in the day. He did. He thought I was funny. He thought I was smart. He even thought I was a little athletic, that kind of thing. And then, like, one morning, he came down to the breakfast table, you know, dressed in his skull and crossbones outfit, and staring at me like I'm the dumbest thing he ever saw on the face of the planet. Just, like, unbelievable. <clears throat> and, and then grunting, the one-word answers, right? And wolfing down breakfast and back to the room. At 13, the boys go into the cave for about a year. You just don't see them. It's, it's pretty routine. Don't sweat it. They, they come back. But in any event, he loved to make fun of me at every opportunity. So we have a Christmas gathering, you know, the whole family. And in front of my whole extended family, he presented me with this tie. Real snarky speech he gave about he scoured the city of Philadelphia to try to find a tie that would express his father's taste level in clothing, right? <laughs> and everybody laughed at my expense. But don't feel bad. I, I got him back. I wear it everywhere I go. <laughs> right? I was on the Today Show, and the guy said, Dr. Bradley, your tie's giving a camera problem. And I said, yeah, my son picked that out for me. <laughs> They passed a silly rule, you can't beat them anymore, you know, so sarcasm fits in pretty well. In any event, oh, and I will apologize in advance for swigging on the water. The voice is a little thin, but we'll get through. <clears throat> uh, my daughter's comments notwithstanding. Sarah, no joke, is another reason I got in the trauma business. Sarah is our adopted daughter. We're foster parents in Bucks County, and uh, so she came to us, and she was a year old. We were her fifth placement in the first year of her life. She was born opioid and amphetamine dependent, addicted. You can imagine, she was premature. When we got her, she wasn't even on the scales for height and weight. She had no hair, no teeth at a year. You know, like nothing going on. She was being starved to death, and one of those great foster parents, by the way, are the best and the worst people you're gonna ever meet, just to let you know that. So, 
She, it was an emergency removal. She had a scar on her arm, yada, yada. So you can imagine. By the way, just losing four families in the first year of your life, you know how babies attach to that caregiver's face. So she was the queen of trauma. And uh, whenever I would leave on a speaking trip, she would get weirded out. You know, another loss, going away. You know, so I would always snuggle her down to sleep before I left. And one night I snuggled, snuggling her down to sleep, she turned to me and said, Daddy, are you gonna die soon? And I'm thinking, there we go, trauma, loss, everybody disappears, and I said, honey, I don't think I'm gonna die soon, and I'm gonna do everything I possibly can to try to keep that from happening, okay? She said, okay. And then I said, Sarah, can I ask you, why did you ask me if I was gonna die soon? And Sarah said, and I quote, well, Dad, because, you know, just like, look at you. <laughs> Be very careful what you ask a teenager. <laughs> they think you want the truth. So, so her uh, predictions notwithstanding, we'll push on. So what's the first thing that's killing kids' resilience, that's crushed um, their ability to cope in the present world? Um, their brains don't work well. In case you haven't noticed that, right? Veteran parents, you, you did see that thing where you thought that kid was gone forever and then they come back at some point. It's like some, for some it's 17, for some it's 18, for some it's 25, which we're hoping for in our household, you know, with one of them. So, it, but sooner or later, it's like the brain wires in and suddenly they can get it. But getting from 13 to getting it can be really freaking scary. The short course on what's happening is Mother Nature is uh, rewiring the brain, quite literally. Have you guys had any seminars on this? I don't want to repeat stuff you know. Well, I'll, I'll move through it quickly. Yeah, uh, it's an amazing process. She's getting that brain from a child's brain, which can be nice and pleasant and seem to be compassionate and all that, but it ain't really. They're just, when kids are, and sorry to you newbie parents, when kids are young, they're kind of smart puppies. Sorry. Neurologically speaking, you know, uh, psychologically speaking, they can be wonderful, but it doesn't mean much because it hasn't been tested yet. Then when they hit adolescence, Mother Nature decides to give them all sorts of insight, all sorts of capabilities to say things like, why should I do my homework? I'm never going to do algebra. This is stupid. Why would I ever do algebra? Um, they challenge. They say you're politics, your religion, your clothes, your <clears throat> middle class lifestyle, all that stuff, suddenly they're attacking these things and it makes parents crazy because you're not used to trying to have this TV debate with your own child. What you're seeing you should be welcoming because that child is now on the path to becoming an adult. However, Mother Nature or God or whoever you believe in has a sense of humor because she, he, or it starts the process in the back of the head and moves forward. What's in the back of the head? Something we call the child brain. Child brain is, is all back, well not all, mostly back here. And it operates like a four-year-old. It's just full of feeling. It knows what it knows. It knows what it feels. It can't recall the past, really. And it can't care about the future, really. It's only in the moment. So. What else is in that child brain? Uh, passion, sexual drive, need to dominate, need to be tough, um, need to take risks, like do screwy things in the middle of the night, take dad's car and see if it'll cross the creek behind the house. That actually was a case of mine, that, this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's what goes on in the back of the head. What's in the front of the head is what we call the adult brain, and we'll go over this in more detail maybe after the break. The adult brain is up front, the prefrontal cortex, amazing piece of work. What's the prefrontal cortex do? It's like the committee. People call it the executive function. The prefrontal cortex can remember the past, and it organizes that as, as science, as data, and can make good predictions about the future about a time in the future that doesn't exist. And get this part, it can care about a time in the future that doesn't exist. It's only a construct. Do you guys save for retirement? You throw a few bucks in the bank? How far away is retirement? Why are you doing that? Because your prefrontal cortex 
has learned stuff saying, wow, you know, retiring can be expensive. I got to save some money. So you deny something you want now. You could always buy another golf club or whatever. Thinking about a time in the future that doesn't exist. Guys, that's freakish that we're able to do that. We're the only creature that does that. It's really stunning. Other creatures do what looks like planning, but it's just reflexive. It's an evolutionary process. What we do is actually think about it and invest in it. That's in the adult brain. So if I was going to configure these things in adolescence, I'd have a huge C brain, child brain, and a teeny tiny adult brain. Teeny tiny adult brain. You've got a huge, it's got a monstrous race car. You've got a Bugatti. It's got 1,200 horsepower. Oh, we forgot to put in the brakes. We forgot to put in the brakes. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you're driving home, and you're like all tired and angry because you had to sit through the seminar for three hours and you pull out on the street, some jerk cuts you off, right? Big SUV truck with, you know, all this gold and stuff all over it and he cuts you off <clears throat> and you get mad. You know what happens inside you? Your child brain starts throwing out all these recommendations. Run up on his rear end, you know, <laughs> blare the horn. I know, do 100 miles an hour and get around him and then stop on your brakes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now you act like you don't get that, but you do. We put you in the brain scanners. And when that happens, that child brain is fired up. And hopefully you take that stuff and it, in a nanosecond goes to your adult brain. And your adult brain says, take a chill, wait a second. You know, we know the guy's like nuts. Uh, he's probably got a gun. He may be drunk. Do you want to die over 10 feet of asphalt? And then you go, oh, I guess not, you know, hopefully. And you back off, you let him go. Key point, guys, did you make the correct decision? Yes. How do you feel when you made that smart decision? Not happy. Not happy. Everybody got that? Everybody says, oh, you must be proud of yourself. You know, Dr. Bradley, you made a good decision. No, I want to run the guy off the road. I want to punch him in the face. You know, I want to pay him back. That's what my child brain wants. But my adult brain says, trust me, it's a bad idea. And I have faith in my adult brain because I followed my child brain too many times and it took me to bad places. So I say, all right, all right, all right, all right. That night, how do we feel about having let the jerk go on his way? Then we feel better. We think, yeah, I would have looked real cool having a fist fight on the side of the road, you know, at age 68. Uh, I'm glad I didn't do that. You all got the drill? So your teenagers have this thing raging and very little access to the adult brain. The adult brain, it grows in two ways in adolescence. One, literally the size and it does the bulk of its development in adolescence. But it also is a matter of the connections between the child brain and the adult brain. The wires become much more proficient over time. They're really freaking slow in early adolescence. Guys, think about the kids you've worked with. That, you know, the, the kids create babies when they shouldn't. They do drugs. They drive at 110 miles an hour down 309 and all that kind of stuff. I just had a record, by the way. A kid told me he clocked himself at 135 in a car that the parents gave to him. So hey, I'll take this out for, for a run. So, well, a high-powered Mustang, yeah. It's a whole other thing about the parents. But in any event, so they, later that night, how do you feel? That's where you get the payoff, okay? But in the moment, they can't connect the two the way you hopefully can now in that nanosecond because the wires are bad. The transmission circuits really aren't online the way they should be. So you've dealt with kids who created babies, who drove too fast, that got in fist fights because somebody said something he didn't like. And then you ask them the dumbest question in the world. What do you ask them? Why did you do that? And if the kid is honest, what does he say? Oh, no. Oh no. That's if he's honest. Typically what they'll do is start a fight with you because they feel like they're nuts because they can't explain their behavior. You'll see that flash in their eyes and then they divert, you know, and then they attack you. You know, you're stupid and you don't know, you know, you're an old person, whatever, because they don't want to say, I, I, I think I'm insane, which some kids will say if they're truthful. I think I'm freaking insane. They don't know. So you'll sit down with a kid and say, how many sex ed classes have we had in this school? 
I don't know, five. Did you know that unprotected sex can create babies? Yeah. Well, why did you do what you did? Oh, no. I do. The child brain, a runaway train. Everybody got that? So stop asking, why did you? That's a philosophical question. <laughs> you know, don't, don't do that. It just makes things go in a bad direction. And sex ed is important. You know, drug education is important. But guys, you know better than I. A lot of these kids know the information on the evils of marijuana. It's a very risky thing. We'll talk about that. Than the experts do. They get that, they listen, they struggle through the classes, and it all gets recorded in that adult brain. But the adult brain isn't saying, let's go get high, let's go have sex, that's the ch child brain. Everybody got that? So a better way to handle these crises, it's not to say, why did you, what's wrong with you, how many times have I told you? Is that another phrase? It rings from my parents in my head all the time. How many times have I told you? A better way to handle it is, okay, what did you learn? Tell me what you learned. That's an inquiry. You're not insulting them. You're not making them feel crazy. It actually lets them feel a little more sane because their adult brain can learn, even at 13. So the kid would say, oh, I guess I learned I should just walk away when somebody you know, calls me a fag or whatever. Cool. What would you do next time that happens? Well, I'd, I'd like to walk away. Cool. Okay. How do we help you learn some skills to do that? Everybody got the drift? So don't go over, don't go at them like they're crazy and stupid and ignorant and, you know, trying to do this on purpose. If they're truthful, they often say, I don't know. I have no idea what's happening with me. When we explain this paradigm, which I'll explain later, it really helps kids. It's amazing. When I teach this to them, you just see this relief on their face. Because it gives them an understanding of their own insanity, mine too. You ever do something stupid? Right, yeah, me too. And it also gives them hope. Say, so it's okay, you're gonna get better at this game. It's all right, you know, struck out a few times. We're gonna work on it, you're gonna be okay. Um, <clears throat> when does this start? Well, it used to be 13, now it's 12, some people say 11, and we don't know why. You all know that girls are sexually developing at younger and younger ages, and we don't know why. No, it's not the milk. It's not the hormones. We've ruled out everything. Right now, the experts are saying, I don't know. We don't know why it's happening. I'll tell you an interesting theory is when we talk about the culture around our kids, that the sexualization that we're doing of young children may be triggering this early development. How about that for a while? It's not been proven, but I was at a seminar where the guy said it and I said, that's it, I'll bet my money on that one. I don't have this science behind it, but there's something else going on and they can't figure out what that factor is. And girls start down this path ahead of the boys. Typically about 18 months ahead of the boys. This transition into the exploding child brain. Yeah, the girls first. By the way, Parents who've raised both, which would you say are harder to raise, girls or boys? Girls. <laughs> yes. I know it's an occasional boy nightmare story, but yeah, 92% of parents who've raised both say the girls are tougher. I'm laughing because I was part of that research. I asked this one guy, you know, which were harder, and he said, well, let me think. When my son was 14, he was a maniac. He used to explode and kick the door off the jam on time. He used to punch holes in the walls. He was a mess. And then our daughter turned 14, and boy, did we miss our son. <laughs> Why is that? Boys tend to have explosions, right? They're Vesuvius, and they're, you know, crazy King Kong. And then, often, the next morning, they can't remember what happened. Yeah, you know, they'll come down and say, I'm really pissed off at you, I just don't know why, you know, but I'm really pissed off at you. They're just not as organized as the girls. Girls organize, right moms? They may not kick holes in the walls, but they'll get your spouse, your partner against you. Daddy, you know what mommy said? They'll talk to the neighbors, they'll talk to your mother-in-law, you know, you get that call from mother-in-law. Now, honey, I know it's hard to raise a teenager. Now you want to strangle two people, right? <laughs> All that kind of stuff. Yeah, girls will do that. They're really, you know, girls cannot talk to you for a week. Really, seriously. Moms will, you know, and you're, some of you are going through it now. When I do the parent seminars, I always see some tear track faces, and I know it's moms that just had this thing with the daughters. 
boys are not tough enough to not talk to you for a week. They're just not organized. The girls, can, they're amazing in conflict, what they can do. Boys will punch your door. You know what a girl did one time? A mom who was a, um, a attorney, high-powered attorney, and she had the wardrobe, you know, the shoes, million dollar shoe closet kind of thing, not a million, but you know, a closet just for shoes, you got the picture? And because uh, she had to dress the part, and she loved her shoes. And she had a big blowout with her daughter, and she had said the daughter disappeared for an hour, and then went off to school and said, bye mom, have a good day. And daughter went off to school, and all her after school activities, mom came home thinking, gee, she's growing up. It was really nice of her to do that. Goes upstairs to get into her comfort shoes and found every left shoe was missing. <laughs> her daughter had packaged up every left shoe in trash bags and put them out the window, gathered them up on her way to school and put them in a dumpster somewhere. You wanna wound a fashionable woman? Right, think of the thought that went into that. I, I felt like getting that girl to sign an autograph. Would you mind that? that <laughs> Damn, that's like marine sniper. That's like, wow, how do you do that? Wow. Yeah, so they're very different. And by the way, I hear more complaints from teachers and aides and people working with kids about the girls than the boys. That the girls can get under your skin and they can work you, work you, work you. And particularly women have a hard time with that because a lot of girls will play the helpless card, the victim thing, and whining, and it just makes grown women crazy. So, so just so you know, they can work against your innate wiring. Um, oh, and by the way, does that ring a bell about the girls 18 months ahead of the boys in terms of brain changes? Ladies, do you remember being in like, you know, seventh grade and looking around the classroom, middle school, co-ed class? What was going on? What were the boys doing in the typical co-ed class? Spitting, right? Making rude noises, pulling hair, spitballs, right? Remember that? And the girls were sort of like listening, trying to take notes, engaged in the conversation. Remember that? Remember the sinking feeling you had looking around the room, thinking that one day you'd have to pick a mate out of that gene pool? <laughs> so those seventh grade boys weren't looking so good. So where did you start to hang out? the ninth grade classroom. Let's head over to the high school after school. What do you say, ladies? Yeah, and then the parents go crazy. Why can't you date a boy your own age? Why do you have to chase the older guys? Because they ain't older. If I brought in the brain scans and show the girls and the boys, that girl seventh grade and the boys ninth grade, they're essentially equivalent, much closer. So that explains, it levels out later. At like 23 to 25, it finally levels out. 25, does that ring a bell? That's when the development mostly ends. It still gets tweaked into the early 30s, but the, the major league stuff is done by 25. Does that ring any bells? What's the kitchen advice from female to female? Don't depend on a guy until he's at least 25. Because up to 25, they're all about motorcycles and football and chasing women, and maybe they calm down at 25. And we've got these brain scans that support all this folklore about you know, sexual development and sexual attitudes. Okay. Um, by the way, in fairness to the girls, as my wife keeps saying, next life I'm coming back as a male because it's much harder, in fairness to the girls, in so many ways. A key part is the sexual pressure, which has just exploded. We're measuring sexual pressure in kindergarten. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, girls thinking about their weight, how they look, who's dating who, like that never used to happen. And now it's actually happening thanks to something else we'll talk about in a minute. And by the way, the sexual pressure alone is enormous in terms of stress. Remember I said drip, 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 stress? The boys can behave sexually any way they want and they're essentially cool. How about girls? After all these years, girls have two choices. You can be a prude or you can be a slut. What would you like to be? We got A and B, pick one. We get pick one, because you're going to get labeled, and the boys don't typically suffer that. This is sexual identity issues aside, but for people who are heterosexual, the girls get hammered, hammered, hammered. On top of that is sexual differences. So you take those pressures that we're talking about, and you have a kid who's sexually atypical, and you can just exponentially ratchet that up, exponentially. 
And that's a big piece. By the way, as these factors increase, uh, so does the suicidology. Boys typically complete or, if you can say successful, at suicide more. Girls attempt far more and uh, serious attempts. And in terms of sexual differences, if you have a GBTLQ kid, then you've got an exponential factor of maybe two to fourfold. So these kids are automatically, you know, in your vision should be red flagged. Like we immediately start to address that. By the way, use the S question. Do you all know about that? I hope you've had some training in it. You never hesitate to say, can I ask you? You always ask if you can ask a question. Another trick, don't roll in and say, are you thinking about killing yourself? Well, screw you, you know, who are you? You start by asking permission to broach somebody's boundaries, right? Say, listen, can I ask you a question? And then they give you permission, permission to enter sort of thing. So thank you. Listen, I'm just worried you're under a lot of stress. Do you ever wish you weren't alive? That's question one. If they say, no, you know, that doesn't cross my mind, it's cool. But if they say yes, then, you know, hug them physically or verbally. Thank you for telling me that. That's hard to say. Question two, have you ever thought about ending your life? And again, if the kid says, no, you're fine. If the kid says, well, yeah, I, I have thought about that. Again, say, thanks for telling me, man. That's hard to say. Question three, have you thought about how you would end your life? If the kid says, yeah, you know, I've thought about it. Dad's got a, a gun in the gun lock that, uh, you know, dad doesn't know I have the combination to. I've been down that trip three or four times. Um, then you say, thank you for telling me that. And then you move into action immediately, get a risk assessment. But the more you use the S word with kids, the less it happens. It's in a different context coming from an adult. Some people argue, well, they, they use it with each other all the time, but that's the drama nonsense that goes on on the internet. It's the passion play that's really involving the child brain. When a grown up, an adult, asks them the straight up question, I'm sorry, it involves the child brain when they're doing suicide on weekends on the internet. When you ask them, it's their adult brain comes online and then they're better able to report. And it makes them safer, because you're sort of calling it out before it really takes over. So what kind of things happen during this transition period? Well, the first thing is the teenagers get a tad moody. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, that you know, when they were eight, nine, 10, they were really pretty much stable and predictable, and you knew what you're gonna get the next morning when you tuck them in at night. And then you hit adolescence, and it's like, I have no idea. Spin the roulette wheel and see what comes to the breakfast table. Well, yeah, they get a little moody. Um, what you're looking at is uh, neurotransmitter irregularity. Part of the renovation process is the wiring and the whole biochemistry of the brain goes squappers for a bit. Anybody renovate their house? Renovate your kitchen? We're still dealing with that. Yeah, our, you know, our three-month renovation, we're starting our 14th year. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. And my wife says, I, I, if we're gonna tear out another room, I'm leaving, call me when it's done. I can't do dust anymore. I cannot do drywall dust. And I, I'm with her on that. So it's really, it's a hard time getting through that. But uh, the brain just kind of gets disorganized. The neurologists call this exuberance because there's all this growth and stuff going on. But it can cause some things <laughs> that seem so generic, it's amazing. First of all, moms with your daughters, did you ever go through this? Your previously reliable, predictable, calm, stable daughter, you're in the you know, living room and she's in the kitchen in front of your pantry, right? And you've got $5,000 of the food in the pantry and you hear banging and slamming and she's cursing. You say, I didn't know she knew those words and stomping and muttering to herself and she's saying that there's... Oh, you've heard this, huh? And since this is your first kid, you're dumb enough to get involved in that conversation. <laughs> it's okay, you'll figure it out. So you go rolling in saying, honey, honey, calm down. You know, they've got lots to eat. Look, we've got a whole pantry full of food. No, there's not, there's nothing here I like. You only buy food for my creepy little brother. You never like, buy what I like. Honey, look, take a look. We'll hey, we got tuna fish. You love tuna fish. I'll make you a nice bowl of tuna fish. What do you say? I don't kill living creatures to sustain myself. <laughs> 
You killed a hell of a lot of them last week. That was last week. I'm a militant vegan today. Okay, cool. That's great. No, I respect that. It's, I think that's an enlightened view. It's hard to do. You know, that's cool. I'll tell you what. Let's see what else we got. We got pasta. Look at, look. It's vegan pasta. Look at this, honey. You love pasta. It's vegan. I'll make you a nice bowl of pasta. What do you say? Pasta. Pasta. I know what you want. You want me to eat lots of pasta so I'll get fat and I won't have a boyfriend. I hate you. I hate this family. Ah, bang. Goes the door, right? Yeah. What are you looking at? Neurotransmitter unreliability. That you get these flares in momentary frustrations and the child brain explodes. It goes on fire. And she can't access the adult brain to say, mom's just trying to be nice. What's the big deal? Whatever. They used to say it was hormones. This is, you know, girls and hormones. We actually see it in boys in different ways. It's not hormones directly. It's the brain changes. It gets better as you survive those years. But for a couple of years, survival can be the goal. They become a tad impulsive. Have you noticed that one? They'll say and do things you just couldn't believe, right? You know who else is more astounded at what they said and did? They are. Seriously. I get them in the office, and I'm not their parents, so they'll tell me the real deal. And that's when I get the story about, I must be insane. I must be, I don't, this makes no sense to me why I would do this. You know, I'm not a threat. I have to keep their secrets. So uh, the impulsivity, again, I kind of explained that. That's the huge engine with no brakes going on. But a couple of pieces within the impulsivity are really key, guys, as parents and as educators. First, because of this imbalance, huge child brain, small adult brain, if I was going to configure it, it would be like this versus that big. This is the adult brain in an adolescent, early adolescent. And that's actually more than just being cute on a blackboard whiteboard, it's actually the way we evaluate function in these different sets of brain circuits. So um, a key part of this imbalance is that they value rewards over risk. They value rewards over risk. Now doesn't that make sense to you? Because what is reward? Reward is this feels good. This will be cool. I want this. I'm going to do this. What's risk? Risk is an adult brain process. When you risk evaluate, you get factors, right? You say, let me do some research. Let me see what the uh, reliability of this automobile is. Uh, okay, that's these factors. I'll go to another place, and I'll figure out what the risk is if I get this car. What's your child brain say? Two seats, red, great wheels, I'm buying it. <laughs> two, two very different brains warring inside the head. Right? If you think about your own lives, what is it that you hate to do? What do you not feel like doing that you should do in your own lives right now? Laundry? Yeah, shopping? Uh, cleaning the garage? Right? Don't you get wars in your head? I really should clean out the garage. I don't want to. Yeah, but then I'd have all this room. I don't care. I don't want to. Yeah, but then we could get the car in. We'll do it tomorrow. No, we won't. We never do it tomorrow. We always say that. I swear to God, this time we'll do it tomorrow. I swear to God, I swear to God. Let's just get a beer and watch the game. Right? Am I lying or flying? Well, that's in your grown-up brain where you've got a great adult that can argue. But the kids are imbalanced. So they value reward over risk. They know there's risks. They heard the stuff in sex ed and drug ed but they value the reward, it overwhelms them. And by the way, when we are young, young adolescents, and you've probably forgotten it unless you kept a really good journal, your reward circuits are hypersensitive, hyperreactive. So ice cream, sex, fast cars, climbing out the window in the middle of the night are wildly, wildly reinforcing. As we get older, those reward circuits start to calm down a bit. And we can think more about risk versus reward. We'll come back and talk about that when we talk about drugs. Oh, finally, a key piece of the brain. Have you noticed they don't go to sleep like the rest of the world? Have you noticed that? Do you know how many hours of sleep a teenager is supposed to be getting? Nine to ten. Nine and a half is the number most of the experts pay. You know what the average sleep is of your teenagers? It's six and below. 
Yeah, five seven is the number I see most of the most of the time. In other words, they get two thirds of their sleep. I have an idea. Let's do an experiment. Uh, out in the lobby, I have a bunch of psychologists. They're very scary people, by the way. Be careful, psychologists. Nothing personal, but uh, they're going to evaluate you. We're going to do full psych evals on all you guys, and then when you come, we're going to come back in three months. We're going to reevaluate you and see how you're doing. I forgot. In those three months, I want you to cut your sleep by a third. So if you typically get uh, eight hours of sleep a night, I want you to cut it to five and a half. If you get six hours of sleep, I want you to cut that down to four. And I want you to do that for three months. And we're going to come back and see how you're doing. What are we going to find? You guys going to be uh, ADHD, depressed, anxious, maybe even suicidal, so exhausted. Guys, you can't cut sleep and then make up for it on the weekend. And you can't bank sleep by sleeping 12 hours on the weekend and then going to school. It don't work like that. The most important thing any human being will do in any day is sleep that night. And it has to be good sleep, contiguous sleep. It can't be naps. Naps actually typically destroy sleep. You're going to nap, it's an emergency, it's 20 minutes back on your feet. But a lot of these kids come home and nap for hours, then they're up till one, two, three, and then they have to get up for six uh, to get into school by seven. And you wondering why they're not getting excited about AP calculus and they're drooling on the desk, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you've seen them. They're like comatose. They are comatose. When we measure their brain readings, we find out they are pre-coma readings. These kids that come in with four and five hours of sleep. Every day you cut sleep, you do insufficient sleep. So say day one, Monday, a Monday night, you only get that four hours, and the kid's supposed to be getting nine, right? So you would say Tuesday, he's short five hours. Well, what about Wednesday? If he does the same thing, is he short five hours? He's short 10 hours. It's like a credit card. You accrue something called sleep debt. And then sleeping 12 hours and 12 hours on the weekend doesn't fix what was lost. Read about sleep. You know, we can do hours and hours on that, but just punch it up. It's critical. Sleep, you know when you study at night? Do you know when you learn the stuff you studied for graduate school or whatever? When you're asleep. When you're asleep. Hey, bodybuilders, you know, you're working out in the gym. How do you build muscle? When you lift those weights, you build muscle, right? Wrong. You destroy muscle. You actually damage it. You tear it. Then when you go to sleep that night, your brain, among other things, surveys your body and says, oh, we got some damage here. We better repair that. And since that damage has been there a few times, we have to, uh, uh, we have to account for the increased demand that this person is doing with these muscles. So we're going to add on more muscle when they're asleep. Guess what the last thing is? The brain hoses off toxins in the last phase of sleep. Sleep is a series of sub-programs. It hoses all the crap off from all that stuff it did all night long. It's a very active process. And then it gets rid of the plaques and the toxins that are built up and literally washes it off. It goes down the drain. When your kids stumble into school, they're brain toxic. They haven't been able to wash the brain. And that's why Fridays or zoo days, a lot of teachers don't even try to teach. Just like, you know, please, nobody kill anybody, and we'll do a movie, we're going to have a group talk. You can put your heads down, because you can see it, right? You can see the decline over time. Then when they go out on vacation, they, they all start sleeping 10 hours a night, usually from midnight till 10 the next morning, but then they're great. They come in, they're like new human beings. Residential treatment programs, why are they successful? Biggest factor is we take away their screens and we shut off the lights at 9 o'clock at night. They're so freaking bored they go to sleep. <laughs> and they get up in the morning <clears throat> and we make them walk around. They don't have to run. It's not SEAL school. You can walk, you know, just a nice walk. We make them eat good stuff. Yeah, we got good, well, I don't eat this junk. You know, I don't eat fruit for breakfast. Okay, then don't eat. It's fine by me. Then they get so hungry they eat. Wellness, sleep, diet, and exercise. We transform kids. We get kids that are into the wellness thing. We're able to reduce, sometimes eliminate medications for ADHD, anxiety, depression, even suicidal thinking by actually doing wellness.
And that's what helps you feel okay, and that's why you'd be out of your minds in three months from now with two-thirds of the sleep you're supposed to be getting. So there's another fight for the colonel, which is... Is uh, one of the objectives we're studying next year, beginning in August, to have an apparent community committee for start time? Fabulous. Just so you know, but you're, you're a tough guy. You know what you're getting into. I've done these seminars for you know, everybody across the country, and the coaches all, you know, and everybody jumps up and says, right on Dr. Bradley, we, we know. You're not telling us anything we don't know. We see it in our kids' faces. But you gotta get the whole state to do it at the same time so that we can coordinate the start times of games. Otherwise, my kids are at a disadvantage. And the other thing is a lot of parents count on these kids, the older kids, to be daycare providers. They get home first. And we have so many single parent households now, they, and they can't afford childcare. So that, that's a whole nother piece. I, I endorse the effort, but. Most of the districts in the county are, going, are doing the same thing. Cool. That's great. That's wonderful to hear. And that can change things enormously. And by the way, as kids start to feel better, we teach that. We say, do you know, we ask them to keep a lock, you know, rate right on a scale one to 10, these factors. And then they start to become, become convinced that sleep works. <clears throat> um, the athletes in college, you know, they have bed checks. Because when they sleep, you know, the D1, the competitive teams, they win. When they weren't sleeping, they weren't winning. So it's real simple. Lots of data out there. So it's wonderful to hear. Made my day. Um, okay. Second anti-resilience factor is the world around our kids, guys. And the world truly qualifies as crazy. What, in essence, is happening that's different? The kids are being pounded with a series of cultural prompts to act out in ways that can hurt them. That's like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Rock and roll means violence. Violence doesn't mean pummeling or knifing somebody. Uh, kids can be verbally violent. They can be uh, violent in the cyber world. So violence has also resurged. And that's why we have so many anti-bullying programs. We'll talk about why that is in a second. What about drugs? The biggest drug issue I need to beat you up with today, particularly as parents, is marijuana. Um, just as the time that we're getting relaxed about it, we're decriminalizing, we're going legalization. And you know, 20 years ago, I was saying, yeah, absolutely. This is, you know, it's silly. It's, you know, marijuana risks are essentially the same as alcohol, which means teenagers can't do it, by the way. But in any event, we used to say, well, you know, what's, what's the harm? Well, it turns out, guys, that the weed that's out there today should be renamed than the weed that was around when you were around in teenage years. The weed that was out there when I was a kid <clears throat> versus today, uh, the weeds that's out there is now is three to nine times as potent. So if you were doing 90, if you were doing 10 milligrams 30 years ago, smoking a little weed, kids today are doing 90, to 300 milligrams. It's that severe. It's a different substance because we've concentrated the dose. And if you don't believe that, well, if you're taking your hay fever medication instead of taking one pill, take three or nine and tell me how that works out for you. <laughs> tell me if that feels different, if it's having a different impact on your body. Don't actually do that, folks. Take my word for it. <laughs> yeah, it won't work. So. Uh, it's a different drug. Kids don't know that because what they're hearing from us, the cultural prompts, it's all around them. TV, press, uh, and particularly on their screens. That weed is fine, it's the answer to all the problems in the world. It is going to help with our tax problems, so the government is laying down on this. They don't want to hear what a lot of us have to say, which is we have the brain scan showing it rewires the architecture of a teenage brain. It rewires the architecture of a teenage brain. It's not a dispute, it's a fact. Nobody wants to hear it, because it creates bad news for everybody. Guys, kids can't do drugs. Alcohol equally can rewire a teenage brain. It's a dangerous drug for a teenager. If they get to 21 to 25, it becomes much less risky. So does weed. But teenagers can't use, and they use them like crazy. Uh, the latest research, a huge study, I just was combing through it, but the numbers break out like this. If you look at risks of drug abuse, in other words, people say weed is not a gateway drug, well, you decide, I'll tell you the numbers. 
when we define regular use of a drug, we're talking about once a week or more. You all got that? So if somebody uses a drug once a week or more, they're considered a regular user. What if you have a group of 25, 21-year-old kids, and they say, hey, we're 21, we can start to use now. Of that group of 25 kids that uses regularly, one will become a substance abuser slash addict to some substance. What about at 18 years? Group of 18-year-olds start using, of those 25 kids, three become full-blown abusers slash addicts. What about at 16? A group of 25, 16-year-olds, six will become full-blown substance abusers, drug addicts. And what about at 14, which is becoming the common age of onset of regular use of marijuana? You ready for this one? 17 of 25 kids will become full-blown substance abusers or addicts. You all got that? People's jaws are dropping as we look at this, and we can't get it on TV. I've been all over the shows that I was on before, and they're like, well, you know, it's frightening. They don't want to hear about it because it looks like the answer to so many problems. And there's a lot of money involved in weed, a lot of smart money three-piece business suit money is pushing bogus science on weed. Um, guys, it may be a missing link piece of the opioid crisis. You're all hearing about the opioid epidemic, right? Well, there's a big conundrum because people are saying, why suddenly do we have this monstrous sea of opioid addicts we never had before? A couple of interesting points. Um, one is certainly docs overprescribed to Big Pharma, you know, wonderful people, pushed the docs to overprescribe, and they published bo bogus science saying you can't get addicted to painkillers. But those of us in the business were saying, no, nah, that's not all of it. Something else is missing. And another interesting study, punch up, you know, the Vietnam War guys, the wild use of heroin in Vietnam. Wild use, widespread use of heroin. And when they came home, they cleaned up. And everybody was like scratching their heads. How could that happen? Everybody knows when you're on heroin, that's it, right? Ship has sailed, monstrous life changes. How could these folks have come home after using, the tours were short, you know, typically a year or less. However, how could that be possible? Well, I think we now have the answer, guys, because we know that teen brains are wildly responsive to rewards, right? Remember, their brains light up with that. And two, that the weed changes the architecture of the reward circuits. We think that the opioid epidemic, some large percentage, we rage about the percentage, some people say 30%, some people say 60%, is due to the fact that what really changed is we had a couple generations of people that smoked a lot of weed as teenagers, powerful weed, and then they cleaned up. They graduated college, whatever, they said, hey, you know, it's time to stop partying. And they were essentially drug free. They weren't addicts, they weren't abusers. Then they get an, their appendix taken out and the doc says, here's a handful of opioids for the pain. See you next month. They pop the opioid and oh my God, nirvana. I remember getting hurt in the military and they gave me pain pills and I was like, man, I feel stupid, I feel foggy, I'm constipated, not to be disgusting, but you know, that's all right, I'll just do the pain. Today, somebody can take pain pills for one week and become a full-blown addict from zero to 100. How is that explained? It's explained because I think they pre-wired their brains in adolescence. You got it? So a lot of us in the business are saying, if you, you could be you know, the straight edge razor, you can be you know, having, you don't even drink, you do nothing, if you go to the hospital, be very careful. If you smoked a lot of weed as a teen, be very careful about taking those pain pills because they may light you up. And that's why we have to get that message out to kids. Um, okay, as usual, I'm talking too much. Um, so, we have these prompts of <clears throat> sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Kids are getting hit with this stuff all the time. It's the videos they see, it's the music they hear. Question, does that stuff affect teen behavior? cultural prompts, messages from their culture, could it affect them? I used to argue no, I was wrong. 
two killer studies came out that made me look dumb. The first was they wanted to know why kids start smoking cigarettes. Now smoking is down in general among teenagers, and that was a great job that people did. However, most kids still try it. So why do they start smoking cigarettes? Guess what the AMA found was the most powerful predictor of a kid initiating cigarette smoking, not becoming an addict, but trying it. We used to say it was peers who smoke, parents who smoke, socioeconomic class, those were the factors. You wanna know what it is now? How frequently they saw a screen figure light up a cigarette. How frequently they saw a screen figure light up a cigarette. Kids that watched lots of that, that reported seeing lots of smoking on their videos, movies, whatever they were watching, had like two and a half times the rate of smoking initiation over kids who saw little. An amazing factor. Just seeing that puts that in a kid's head. Oh, I should try that. Typically, smoking is done by cool people. Cool meaning the gangsters. The guy with the cars and the women and you know, all like that. It looks cool, so they want to try that because they're teenagers. Second study uh, was looking into why sexual violence against females has exploded. I, get, I hope you all know that. If you don't, hang on to your hats. Yeah, sexual violence, assault against females is off the charts. Even when we account for increased reporting and so forth with rigorous studies, yeah, it's also up between two and threefold over 50 years ago. So why is that happening? One of the things they found was analyzing song lyrics. I know it sounds simplistic, and this is not causal. It's correlational. You could argue one affected the other. But if you graph sexually violent misogynist lyrics, they're all sexually provocative, <clears throat> but misogynist, women are depicted as victims, as chattel, and violent, you're allowed to put your hands to compel sex. As those lyrics have gone up, almost a direct correlation with sexual violence against young females. Almost a direct correlation. It doesn't prove causality, but we worry it provides permission that they hear it over and over and over from heroic figures, the musicians, the actors, and so forth. And it has the effect on men saying they're entitled to do this. It has the effect on women in that they allow it to happen. Guys, I was part of a study on this. We were trying to figure out why women don't report sexual assault, and you know, they don't, right? They do, it bumps up a little bit. But the latest report rate is like 7%. It was down to 2% at one time. Really, are you kidding? You assault me, you're in trouble. You know, I'm gonna scream like hell. Why the hell do women like, you know, bow their heads and let it go? Well, I was talking to one college girl who had been assaulted pretty brutally and said, do you mind sharing, you know, confidentially? Did this happen? Yes. Did you say no? Yes. I said, did you say no more than once? She said, I was begging and crying. I said, okay, thank you for telling me that. I said, can I ask, why did you not report this? And she said, well, you know, guys will be guys. And I said, I'm sorry, miss, I don't understand. What, what do you mean guys will be guys? She said, you're a guy, you get it. And, you know, that's how guys are. And you know, I, I guess I was dressed provocative, you know, we were, I was drinking, they're always drinking. And you know, I, I don't know, guys will be guys. Think about that for a minute. You know, how did that happen? Guys will be guys? And this is part of it. Again, it's acculturation. It's what these kids are being bombarded with. Both the guys who can act it out and the women who can be victimized and decide, you know, well, it's the way it is. So, what I'd like to do is to, um, when you come back from, I've got to do a quick break because I'm talking too much. I want to get to your quarrels and arguments. I've got some other 50-year data that I think you'll find stunning to help you understand what's going on with your kids and maybe come up with a couple of ways of responding to it. Okay. Um, I promise you some other exciting information on what's changed and why is it so much seemingly harder for you to do your jobs than your teachers had, your parents had, back in the day when you were teenagers that you just feel sort of out of your element. And chatting with some of the, the folks on break, you know, one of the things that happened is, I, I wasn't kidding, you got drafted into the mental health business, because a lot of you did sign up to be teachers, you know, predicated on your image of a high school teacher and a 
middle class area and what life was going to be like. Well, just so you know, everybody's been drafted into the next level of challenge. Um, as you know, you know, normal teachers, typical standard high school teachers, you're, you're all special ed teachers now, right? Do you all agree with that? Yeah, okay. And that's why we're here today. And by the way, you special ed teachers, you're now dealing with kids that we used to set off to alternative learning centers, right? Your kids are pushing the boundaries and a lot of you are saying, hey, I wasn't trained for this. And what about those alternative learning schools? They're dealing with kids frequently that were put in residential treatment programs. And they're saying, we're not equipped to do this. This, is, this isn't what I signed on for. It's not what I was trained for. Programmatically, we're not set up for this. So if it's any comfort to you, everybody's out of their depth. And everybody's trying to make this up as we go along. But I was talking to your superintendent about this academy concept. You know, amazing, right on. That's the kind of you know, uh, open field running we have to do these days because the challenges are novel. You know, you can't fight the new war with the rules from the last one. You got to start over. It's like, you know, that's, that was interesting. It's a great book. What's the new terrain? What's the new enemy? What's the new weaponry? What's the climate? You know, all that stuff, the culture. So uh, you have to do the same, guys. So don't feel so outgunned, if you will. Everybody's outgunned. But they're falling back and they're coming up with new strategies and tactics that are effective. The, the core truth is, even that kid that you just hate seeing his face Monday morning, he wants to succeed. He wants to succeed. Look, I've had kids, I've you know, come this close to punching in the face, <clears throat> aside from my own, by the way. So uh, they want to succeed. They're looking for a way out of the madness. And they're trapped in their own brains. They're trapped in their own culture. They're trapped in a lack of support, a lack of understanding for the situation. And next snowflake story I read, you know, I'm, that's the person I'll punch in the face. You know, I just, I can't stand this stuff because nobody's really learning the new war. But there are successful programs that do work because if you get to that core thing, that, that little nugget inside, I believe every human being you know, unless they're a full-blown sociopath, and there's very few of those, they want to succeed. They don't want to be crazy. Our job is to, my wife's mantra to her kids, ES classroom all the time, look, you don't have to be crazy. My wife, by the way, is a uh, retired drug and alcohol counselor. She did that for years. We, we met in the agency she worked at. And she's put in a lot of time in the trenches. And she could have done a cushy middle-class practice with me and she went back to the trenches working with the ES kids. She's a, a guerrilla warrior therapist. She says, I can sneak in and talk to these kids the way you can't, pointing to me, because they ain't ready for it. And she lives with them every day, right? It gives her access, looking for the magic moment to throw in a phrase. And one of them, one of hers is, you know, Samuel, you don't have to be crazy. You ain't gotta be crazy. You have choices. And she just repeats that and repeats that. Um, so, just to let you know, this, we're here today to help equip you a little bit better, but a lot of this is, we're making it up as we go along, because nobody else has been confronted with this stuff. All right, other changes that will give you a little more insight into these creatures. Um, a woman named uh, Jean Twenge wrote a book called iGen, and I hate recommending anybody else's book, so you know this has to be a great one. And uh, Jean, I, I stole most of my stuff from her, by the way, just uh, in terms of full disclosure. Jean is a real laid back, you know, uh, straight up academician researcher in San Antonio, I think, San Antonio State. And uh, <clears throat> she does the best stuff I've seen on adolescence. The iGen book will, will blow your doors off. Um, it's a terrible title. The title to her article was better. The article was, Have Smartphones Destroyed a generation of teenagers. And you'll see why that was a smart title when we get done. So I'm gonna show you a couple of other things. Gene collected. Um, the 50 year data that I'm talking about, that's 70% was Gene's genius. 
So she decided years ago, you know something, we've been using these same stupid questionnaires with kids and these same psychological tests. Some of them we have to keep the same, like the MMPI, if you do any work with that. We have to keep it the same, otherwise the normative data go screwy. So we have these archaic tests, but they're time travel machines. You can go back and see how kids used to answer them and then compare it with how they answered them in the past couple of years. Ding, 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 ding. So she came up with this data uh, that is really intriguing. I'll give you a couple of points of it. One, kids today feel less control over their lives than kids 50 years ago. There's something called locus of control, which has to do with do we feel we have a central control over our lives or is life just a crapshoot? What happens, happens, there ain't nothing you can do about it. Well, when we saw that finding, we were stunned because I don't know what your childhood was like, but my kids had 20 times the advantages that I had. The assets, the money, the tutors, the programs, the great neighborhoods and so, so, you know, all that stuff, but they don't feel they have control over their lives. I remember sitting in the park with my gangster friends and saying, you know, we're gonna do something. We're gonna get out of the hood. You know, I, I'm, I'm gonna be a cop. Yeah, that's cool. You know, I'm gonna be a nurse. Good, great, that's cool. I'm gonna go in the army. I'm gonna save the world. Yeah, cool. So I remember this thing, and we were poor by today's standards. Um, didn't feel poor, life was good. It was just, you know, one pair of shoes, nobody had cars, that kind of thing. But I remember feeling, you know, we can do it. We can make moves and, and make whatever we want out of life. Most kids today say they do not have essential control over the outcome of their lives. That's a huge shift. They see life as a crapshoot. It's like luck of the draw. Second, their goals are now much more materialistic and extrinsic. Back in the day, we used to have questionnaires that would say, you know, what do you want to do? What's it about? What makes life meaningful? So on and so forth, getting kids to think about purpose and passion, remember that? So back in the day, kids used to talk about, I want to be somebody, I want to do something important, you know, the cop, soldier, that kind of stuff. Today, guess what the response is most frequently now? Make a lot of money. I'm gonna make a lot of money. How are you gonna make the money? I don't know, I'll figure that out, but I wanna make a lot of money. Three car garages and exotic cars and so forth. So the goals have shifted from what we call intrinsic. Like I wanna do something that makes me feel good. I wanna do something that contributes to the world, whatever. Now it's I wanna accumulate stuff. He who dies with the most toys wins. You know that bumper sticker? Yeah, well that's sort of what's going on. Next. They're less spontaneous and uh, less interdirected. Less spontaneous and interdirected. We tend to structure the hell out of their lives if they're in the entitled end of things. We're seeing a polarization going on. I don't know what your experience here is, where we've got these super high achieving kids <clears throat> that you know, they hit the ground running at three and four. We started them in the soccer training camps and so forth. And then, uh, and the, all the tutoring and enrichment camps, and then we've got all these kids that can't compete, they don't have the resources, nobody's home. Um, you know, mom's the only parent, she works two jobs. They're just left to their own devices. And there, in this end of the polarization, we're losing the middle ground in youth. We're losing the middle class, if you will. So, in general though, look, talking to these kids who are highly structured, um, and we run them from activity to activity, they don't learn how to do nothing creatively. Parents have decided that there is no hour that should not be filled. They don't have unstructured time. We run them from one organized activity to the other, to the other, to the other. Um, and the research is really clear when you read it. What would you say is uh, more enriching, developmentally helpful to a teenage kid doing the Johns Hopkins Summer enrich Enrichment Program or organizing a heavy metal rock and roll band? Organize the band. Organize the band. Forget the structured program. Why? You ever try to organize a rock and roll? My son, among other things, is a metal musician. He actually gets paid for this in the summers he goes on tour. 
I don't encourage you to listen to his music. I can't stand it, but that's okay. <laughs> He's a great young man. But, you know, he had this burning thing about doing this crazy stuff. And I realized, you know, spying on him, what was he learning? He was learning negotiation, personnel management, uh, organization, budgets, crisis resolution, you know, oh my God, he's drunk, where is he? You know, we gotta get him before the cops do. And I was thinking, oh my God, all this learning. And I wanted him to go to Johns Hopkins, you know? And he would have sat there, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, and regurgitated whatever they were doing and learned what I think is essentially no thing. Guys, boredom in the right dose turns out to be critical to development. Are you young enough? I mean, are you old enough to remember being bored and saying to your parents, oh my God, I'm so bored. And what would the old man say? Oh, I can help you with that. Oh, no, 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 I'll see you later. You'd head out the door. Where I grew up in Southwest Philadelphia, and I am not making this up, in the summertime, we were, you know, we'd get breakfast and then the door was closed and locked. And we were on our own till dinner time. I am not making this up. And we ran the streets, if you will. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. There's a downside. But we would go to the dump behind our house. The dump is a great playground, if you don't mind the carcinogens. But it's, <laughs> seriously, we had to make it all up. We had to make it up as we went along. I had to deal with the gangsters and the predators and the bullies and all that stuff. Lots of risk involved. In fact, the next book, I just got a call from somebody, wants to talk about risk. Because we've decided our kids shall not experience risk. We're not willing to take any risks. And we think that that movement has gone too far and it has caused them not to be able to do self-stimulation, self-organization, staring at the ceiling with nothing to do. Turns out to be very important in the proper dose. Today, nothing to do means the screen. That's what they fill in. It's created a disaster. Back in the day, having nothing to do was so freaking painful, you would invent something, you'd find somebody, you would put up with a friend you didn't like just because they were there, right? Yeah, you used to organize weird games. We had these crazy games, you know, dump games, and it was very creative. We were making stuff up. And the ones of us that survived that experience have done well in life. Um, I did a seminar for, you know, these big corporate CEOs on this because they're in a crisis of hiring. For decades, they used to hire the best of the best of the best. One guy said, yeah, we did the top 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Stanford, uh, MIT, all that kind of stuff. And we would get the absolute best and bring them in. And we noticed problems. Now, this one guy had a war room. You know, I think it was Bloomberg, was that the guy? He just he didn't have offices. It was just in a, like an airplane hangar and all these cubicles so that people would interact. And he'd be up on the bridge watching this stuff. It wasn't Bloomberg, but it was you know, another guy. And he was talking about a crisis hit the corporation. And he had you know, one of those gestalt moments like, oh my god. He had, uh, took a personal hand in hiring uh, kids coming in. He spent all this time interviewing them. And he had this moment where there was some terrible corporation threatening crisis going on. And he said the place was a buzz. People are all over the place trying to figure out what the hell to do. And he uh, noticed that his best of the best of the best were sitting at their desks. And then there's a kid he took a flyer on. This kid got, God forbid, C's in a, God forbid, state school. He had a minor brush with the law. But he just liked the kid. He said the kid had something that he really liked. So he took a flyer and brought him in. He found the kid who had the C's running around, going from group to group, saying, hey, these guys are talking about this. And he would get thrown out. He could get the F out of here. Who do you think you are? You know? And he would just you know, go on to the next group. And he was engaged. Sleeves rolled up, the guy said. And then he looked at his best of the best. They were sitting at their desks, looking around, waiting for the next syllabus waiting to be told what to do. Here you go, do this, memorize this, regurgitate it, you're great. And it hit him. He said, we have to do a new hiring paradigm. Because the kids that have had difficulties, that have, God forbid, failed, have figured out how to respond. They were developing assets of resilience. They got punched in the face, they went down, they said, I didn't die, oh my God, I'm alive. They got back up and fought. 
got back in the game. As opposed to the kid that says, oh, I can't do that. If I get punched in the face, I'll die. Well, how do you know that? Because we won't let it happen, which brings me to the next thing. They're much less self-reliant. They can't figure their way out of things. Why is that? We've decided these kids shall not fail. Teachers, have you been through this? Yeah, my kids shall, now fa shall not fail. Principal, have you been through this? How dare you talk to my kid like that? Meet my attorney? Yeah, the cop? You know, oh, you were mean. You called my son a name. You said he was an idiot. You know, oh my God, you're crushing him. You know, we're suing you for damages. Okay, what is the cost of that? Well, let me give you a, an alternative example. When my son Ross, the genius, was in middle school, he came home um, and he said, <laughs> at dinner, it's after a week of school, and he's, he is literally like brilliant, which is not something I recommend, by the way. <laughs> but he came home and he was in this you know, AP track, you know, gifted, all that stuff. So he says, I just want you guys to know, uh, I intend to not cooperate with social studies this year. <laughs> well, I'm glad he's saying something, you know, okay, well, okay, why not? So, well, I've looked into this, I've done a lot of research, and I've decided that social studies is actually a governmental mind control bro program created by rich white men like you, points to me, uh, <laughs> to advance your interests in this society. So I'm not doing it. So Cindy, I told you, is in the business. She's trying to not laugh, and I look at her, and, and so we said, okay. And he said, okay. And I said, yeah, absolutely, son. Look, I think you got a point. I, you know, I think rich white men wrote a lot of the history. I, you know, I hear that. A lot of people argue that. That's cool. But understand, what you're talking about is civil disobedience, right? He said, yeah. And I said, well, have you read Martin Luther King? Do you know about civil disobedience? Well, sort of. I said, well, what it means is you're taking a stand against a system, against the law, and there will be consequences. There will? I said, yeah. And King said, if there ain't no consequences, it ain't no big deal. That you pay the consequences and then it's a big deal. That's how you pay it off. That's the cred part. You're okay, and I said, just let you know, you wanna do this, I respect that, and know that when the school calls, we'll be handing the phone to you, right? We're not gonna go in and argue for you. Yeah, I guess so. Well, we get the ultimate call from the teacher, I remember it was a Friday, and it was late at night, like 7.38, which teachers are shot. And uh, we go in, and he sits down with us. And I remember he had the you know, 7 o'clock shadow, and his ties down, his end of the week, you know the feeling? And he's like burnt out. He said, I just want to call you guys in to let you know, Ross is a wonderful young man. You know, he's very smart, and you know, I think he's got great potential. So cut the BS. Let's just get to the chase here, please. All right. So uh, I have to talk to you about his grade. And we said, well, okay, what's his grade? He said, well, if I did it by the numbers, his head goes down. I said, it would be an F. And like he was apologizing. And so I said, well, did he, what did he earn? He said, well, as you know, he wouldn't cooperate with the program. So okay, it sounds like he earned an F and he gets an F. And the teacher looks at my wife, she says, absolutely. And he puts down his pencil and he pushes his chair back and he crosses his arms. He said, I need to tell you, I've been teaching here for nine years. You were the first set of parents that did not argue for a better grade for their child. Yeah, you've been there, done that? And Cindy says, without name and name, she says, I know some teachers, they just, they don't want to get the, they know the parents are nuts in her view and they're going to lawyer up, they're going to principal up and they just push the kid through. Everybody says, how do they push these kids through when they get to ninth grade and they can't read? Well, they're, part of the reason is people don't want to say, sorry, there's consequences to not doing homework. It's the way it works. So anyway, Ross was waiting for us, and he says, what did he say, what did he say? And I said, well, you know, he said, you're a wonderful young man, and that you're very bright, and you know, you have great, you, yeah, 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 cut the BS, what did he say about the grade? I said, well, uh, he said, man, you're getting an F. An F? I said, yeah, I remember we talked about it. What did you guys say? We said, well, we asked him what you earned. He said an F. What do you want us to do? Well, he went off and he wrote a paper that weekend. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure he slept one night. And he wrote this paper uh, justifying his stance that social studies is a governmental mind control program 
created by rich white men like me. So, and he ran in Monday morning, ambushed the teacher in the parking lot, and said, here, I want you to read this, because grades are locked in on Monday. And so the teacher starts flipping through it, and he stops, and he reads the whole thing. And he says, Ross, this is really excellent. This is well done. He said, I would like to submit this to a journal that you know, I know of that I think would be interested in having this from such a young student. It, it's very well done, son, excellent. And Ross said, great, then I get an A? And the teacher said, no, you get an F. I didn't ask for this. I asked for these 30 things. You didn't do them. This is great. Ross was furious, and he never got a bad grade the rest of his academic life. Why? He discovered something really important. He discovered he was competitive academically, and he discovered you can make a principled stand and still get the grades. There's ways of you know, handling this stuff. You get the drift? What would have happened if we bailed him out? We threatened the teacher, we got the lawyer. Where would he be? Um, next, the big change is new stressors. What are the new stressors we didn't see before? Excessive expectations and screens. I hate to be that simplistic, but that's what the data says. What are excessive expectations? Well, um, we see it in sports, we see it in music, we see it in athletics. I played a few sports in high school. I would not make your football team. I would not make your football team. I would not make your basketball team. I was a decent player back then. I wasn't good, I wasn't great, but I could make the team. Because a lot of us would like, you know, in eighth grade, seventh grade, start playing basketball a little bit. Your kids have been in training, the bulk of them. They're in training programs and the camps. Some of the soccer players literally have been trained from age four. So soccer is like, no way. And they're stunningly good. What I see in your high school athletes is what I used to see in college athletes. That's how much it's changed. What about academics? Well, you know, I had challenging courses in high school. It ain't nothing like AP. It ain't nothing like AP. Sorry, it just wasn't there. Uh, music. Could I, you know, people used to like pick up instruments back in the day. I'm not making this up. High school, oh, I think I'll join the band. Well, what do you play? I don't play anything, but trumpet looks cool. And they'd be, you know, doing all the bad notes. I go to your high school musicals, and, your, and these kids are like freaking amazing. Unbelievable, where do they come from? They come from years of training. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it is a thing and it creates stress because most of these kids are not built to handle that kind of stress. They're too young, their brains are in process. That level of stress and challenge should be reserved for 18 and beyond. Now, uh, there, you know, college, can be the big stressor, but do we prepare kids by sending them to these AP training courses, or are we better off preparing kids by saying, well, you booted social studies, you gotta figure it out, man. Which is the better way to go? But parents have decided their kids shall not fail. They've decided their kids shall not experience getting cut from a team, um, and they will be coddled, they will be talked to pleasantly at all moments, all that kind of stuff, and it probably that pendulum has swung too far. What about excessive expectations also creates the other group. We have the kids that can't compete. They're never gonna do an AP class. They're never gonna do any kind of advanced class. They barely hang on in basic class. They can't play basketball like those kids on that team. They can't kick a soccer ball. And they're not gonna learn how to play well enough to be in the band. You know these kids. They walk in, they put their heads up, hoods up, and the head goes down on the desk. They're cooked. They've quit. They're done. Because we've decided this is what we should be building in high schools. In high schools. And we have this core cadre of parents that torture you guys to get these kids, you know, four AP courses and all that stuff. I am not a believer. Guys, the research in pounding these kids to get into elite schools, you will get them into elite schools. Will you create a happy human being? The answer is either neutral, has no impact, or negative. About a third of the research says pounding these kids like this creates unhappy people later in life. In my practice, I've dealt, I do adults as well, I've dealt with 
neurosurgeons making three million a year and cops in Philadelphia barely breaking 50,000 a year. And in both instances, I've had people who freaking love what they do and I've had people who freaking hate what they do. And when we start to pound these kids into this elite track, they don't figure out who they are, their identity. In my own case, it's the reason why I wrote the first book, I started out to be an army officer. I don't knock it. By the way, a lot of what I learned here, I'm sure the colonel sees this stuff. Basic military training, yeah, seriously. That's where I learned these conceptually. And then I saw the brain scan that said, damn, that big ugly sergeant was really onto something. You know, it's, it's true. I don't begrudge that, but I found out that wasn't me. So, you know, cool, did my time, learned a hell of a lot, thanks, but I, I'm not re-upping. And then I decided to go to law school. Oh, you know, go to law school, that's what they told me, that would be cool. Law school was fun, I loved the coursework, but they hated me and I hated them. I wasn't interested in chasing ambulances and making a million dollars. It was like, uh, I became a DJ for a little while. You know, it's like this weird, my wife for my birthday, my past birthday, got me a plaque that says, all who wander are not lost. All who wander are not lost. Everything I did fed into this, what I do. And I fell into doing this work. I, I had nowhere to go, I didn't have lunch money. I saw an ad, you know, people that are willing to work in a juvenile forensic prison, if you're that dumb, you know, come on in. And I figured, hey, you know, I was in the army, what could be worse than this, juvenile forensic was. <laughs> but I loved it, it was like, oh my God, these kids, I thought they were gangsters and horrible people, and they were, they were gangsters and horrible people, and they were wonderful people. And they were trying to look for a way out of the madness. It's like, oh my God, they're human beings, they're just like me. They just had bad breaks, you know? And it, Gang kids, I'm not trying to tell you to be sympathetic to gang kids. I would have been a gang kid if there was a gang uh, back in the day, why? There's no government, there's no cops, there's no protection. Gang becomes the government and they protect the neighborhood. I know they do hideous things, but think about a 13 year old brain that sort of makes sense. You know, I don't, I don't see the cops you know, patrolling my, they don't even come in my neighborhood. They're scared to come in my neighborhood. But the gang keeps the other gang out. Makes sense to a 13 year old. It's like the only way. So I backed into that and then all this stuff I had done came together. I do forensic work, I work in the prisons, I use military metaphor all the time that kids relate to. So guys, stop, if it's your kid, stop thinking there's a smooth linear line from training camp for soccer at kindergarten and age four to a successful happy human being. It don't work like that. If anything, you can disable them. Because I see these guys at 40 and 50 and they want to blow their brains out even though they're making 30 million, 3 million a year because it's not who they are. They never figured out who they are. The number one job of a teenager is identity exploration. Doesn't matter what they do, it matters that they do. Right? Engage, not screen, do in world. Learn, learn who they are not as well as who they are. So, excessive expectation. The other thing that's changed, everything is screens, is the screens. And I mentioned Gene Twenge's book, iGen, read it. If your kid, bribe your kids to read it. There's stunning stuff in there. I wish I had time to go over it. She came up with great research about how it's fundamentally changed adolescence and the prices that we're paying for these screens. And the screens are the delivery system for those cultural prompts that I talked about. These deliveries of messages that can cause problems, that really create havoc, chaos, and pain in the adolescent world. Now, were there always uh, negative cultural prompts? Sure, yeah, for all of us, sex, drugs, and rock and roll or violence. But they were never delivered with the efficiency of the weapon that a screen is. Guys, think about it. You maybe knew somebody who knew somebody, you may have seen a movie here and there, kids talking on the corner. It wasn't delivered 24-7 through earbuds and a screen on your hip. They're barraged <clears throat> with these cultural prompts. You dealt with muskets, your kids are dealing with machine guns in terms of trying to make their way through this mass of negative cultural prompts. It's a very different war. <clears throat> and a third irony that 
is a huge anti-resilience aspect to today's teenagers is us, is ourselves, as parents, as teachers, as interveners. Anybody dealing with kids, we're not doing a good job. Why is that? Well, part of it is we're sad and part of it is we're confused. Why are we sad? Well, as a parent, have you noticed that <clears throat> you get angry at your teenager when she mouths off? She calls you a, you know, I'll spare you the words. You know the words better than I do. You teach high school, right? Yeah, it calls you those horrible words. You get mad, you want to punch her in the face, you want to slap her, maybe you do slap her, or you call her the names back. What are you feeling? You're going to tell me it's anger, and I'm going to say, sorry, it's sadness. It's sadness. Why? You're grieving the death of your child. And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but your little wonderful girl who is at your side, best buddies, has died. She's gone. Sorry. You can't have her back. Don't you want them back? Don't you want that sweet little agreeable boy that just thought you were smart and funny and athletic? Yeah, don't you want that kid back? Ross, he was the poster boy for Huggy Children. And when I'd come home from dealing with this stuff, like, uh, he'd come running across the floor, daddy, daddy, daddy. Remember that? And he would jump into my arms. And he would give me a hug that I can feel today. You know that hug? That all accepting, you know, incredible connection. It just, oh my God. You know, it was so wonderful. So this is the part of the seminar where the men are kind of squirreling in their seats a little bit and the women are all tearing up, right? Because women are a little more upfront about their emotions. But I remember that. I remember that feeling. It was wonderful. And then he took it away overnight when I became the enemy. I used to come in the door looking for my hug. He didn't come running up to me. He'd be in the computer room, on the computer, right? Talking to 17 girls. So I would go to him now and I would say, hey, Ross, how you doing? And he would say, uh, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'd say, how'd that social studies project go? Said, fine, I'm kind of busy here, you know what I mean? Gotta catch you later? Sure, he'd catch me later, you little son of a bitch. He asked me for the car keys one day. <laughs> so I walk away mad. I'm not mad, I'm sad. But we act out sad with mad. It feels safer, right? Yeah, it's easier to defend ourselves if we're mad than sad. I missed my little boy. You miss your little girl, your kid? Yeah, me too. You know what else I used to do with Ross? I used to pick him up when he was four. I'd put him on my lap and I'd tickle him up. Remember that? And I used to sniff the top of his head. Remember they had that sweet smell on top of their heads of little kids? I loved that. God, I loved that moment. Well, when he was 13, if I picked him up and put him on my lap, he would get really angry, especially if his friends were there. And you know what else? His head, it didn't smell so good anymore. <laughs> I want my kid back. What the hell's the matter with you? Bring my kid back, you body snatcher. We go through a grief process. Same thing happens with teachers. A lot of teachers who make that shift from elementary ed into middle school or high school, they don't get what they used to get. Guys, kids, when they're younger, take care of us. Wait a minute, no, we take care of them. No, 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 no. They give us lots of affirmation. They think we're cool and funny and godlike and solve all the problems. And then they take it all away as teenagers, from parents and from interveners, meaning everybody here, right? And they're hard to work with. Have you noticed that? They can be arrogant, they know how to push your buttons, they lay traps, they do all sorts of things, catch you off guard ambushes, all that stuff, yeah. But a lot of parents and a lot of interveners quit on them. Say, well, I guess that's over. He's done being raised, he's on his own. And we quit on them just at the time when they need us more than ever before. Folks, the most critical, t I'll get arguments, critical child raising years are not zero to five. I mean, they're important. I don't think they're dominant. I argue the most important parenting, child raising, intervening years are 12 to 18. Why? Their adult brain is coming online. They're able to think. Now they're able to develop identity. They're able to make higher level decisions about morals and ethics, identity stuff. That's where the game's afoot. But that's where we typically back away because they're such a pain to be around. They're obnoxious. We want to hit them. 
And I also said, we're confused. We don't know what to do. Why is that? <clears throat> we don't know what to do. How were you raised? <clears throat> what would, if you said to your parents what your kids say to you, veteran parents, um, what would your parents have done? Exactly. It, yeah, I, I also woke up on the kitchen floor after a brief period of unconsciousness <laughs> when I decided to tell my old man what I really thought about him. Yeah, no kidding, I never did it a second time. But was that a good technique? See, this is where it gets dicey, and this is kind of the debate in front of systems, and that's why I'm so glad to be talking with you today, is should you use fear? See, part of the mythology is that uh, we build strong kids by beating the crap out of them, by using fear-based methodology. What is fear-based? Fear-based methods light up the child brain. That's where you make somebody afraid for their future, for their survival. So they'll put a gun to my head, I'm gonna tell you anything you wanna know. So the key is, how do you get me to say what you wanna hear without the gun? How do you do that? A lot of parents are, and school systems are wedded to fear. Do you know it's legal to beat your kids? Sorry, corporally punish your kids in most states? You do know that, right? And do you know that more states are moving towards legalizing corporal punishment? Do you know that school systems are moving towards not here, but moving towards corporal punishment. The spankings, the paddlings, these sorts of things, isolation, these techniques, because we got to get tough with these kids, right? Because they're snowflakes and they're running the place. We're going to get tough with them. Again, in terms of eclectic education, in the prison, I was part of a whole movement on that because the prison was out of control. No joke, the orientation guy said, to the, the audience of people coming in to work in the prison, just to let you know, the odds of you being seriously injured or killed in this facility are greater than those of an infantryman in Vietnam. I said, nah, no way, and I looked it up, he's right. It was out of control. Assaults, stabbings, riots, it was crazy. And I got into this business because I was there, but also ran into a mentor, a guy named Chuck Schrader, who came up with an entirely different way of viewing kids and how to try to handle the problems. So, uh, the first, the fear-based methodology, everybody's familiar with that. And it's a problem because there's romanticism around it. When I say to parents, it's not a good idea to use fear-based, they get into, well, my father beat me up, my drill instructor beat me up, you know, my football coach beat me up and I turned out to be a good guy. You know, so what's the problem? It, it must work. Let me give you an example of fear-based intervention from an expert, because a lot of people still are into fear-based methods of intervening. This person's name was Peter Joseph Bradley, my Irish Catholic father. And in 1967, we were in his basement as he referred to it. I was with my gangster friends, as he referred to them, and we were listening to the devil's music. Anybody want to guess what the devil's music was in 1967? I warn you, nobody gets this. Not the Stones. Good guess. And they're still alive. Can you believe that? That's, anyway. Hendrix. Who? Hendrix. Not Hendrix. <laughs> Sorry? Not Osborne. Not the Beatles. The not El Who said the Doors? Would you stand up, please? <laughs> The doors, oh. You look all sedate and laid back and conservative. And, uh, you at Woodstock, do I remember you? Yeah. Uh, sure, none of us were at Woodstock, right. We didn't do that. It's okay, I got it. Yeah, no, the doors, good guess. I'd never get that, because all people here, the doors typically are their little goldie oldie romantic things, which they just did to pay for their drugs and women and stuff. Doors, in case you don't know, were a crazy bunch of puppies. So read about the doors, you'll, you'll see what I mean. And, and the songs, by the way, if you're shocked at why my father was so shocked by the lyrics he was hearing coming up the steps, uh, punch up the end, name of the song, be sure it's the original version, non-abridged, listen to the lyrics. I'm not gonna tell you the lyrics, you gotta figure it out. So my father heard this coming up the steps. And my father was very worried about cultural prompts on our brains, right? hearing this stuff. So he came down the steps, trademark cigar in mouth, <clears throat> took out a cigar, picked up the album. Remember albums? 
And they're coming back, by the way. And he smashes it on the record player, which is really scary because the record player, one of my friends had stolen from his sister. And smashing albums is a great parenting technique. It's like shrapnel. It goes all over the place. Like, holy jeez. And then he puts cigar back in his mouth, and we were like sitting, looking up, and I'm not making this up. He took a drag, he blew smoke in our wide-eyed faces, and put the cigar back in his mouth, and towered over us. Now in 67, the old man was, I don't know, 14 feet, 18 inches. Remember how big they used to look? And none of us said anything, you know, because we knew about the neighborhood rule. Did you know the neighborhood rule, Southwest Philadelphia? Anybody's parent can beat up anybody's kid. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not making that up. That used to happen. They just, you know, it was a network. Then he storms back up the steps. Question, was that an effective parenting intervention? You could argue yes. Why? Do you know how much an album cost in 1967 in Southwest Philadelphia? Relative dollars? We begged, borrowed, and I'm sorry, stole to get enough money together to buy this album, and it was hard to find. Everywhere we went, and we don't keep that trash here, you know, you have to go somewhere else. We finally found a record shop that had the Doors album with the end on it. I think that was the first album. That was the end of the Doors, and they didn't play that on the radio back then. They didn't do that. You know why? There were laws about public decency, and hey, if you put this stuff out on public airways, it could affect kids' thinking. And everybody laughed. Oh, pilgrims, oh my God, what a, what a silly concept. What are we gonna do, civil libertarians? Because the horse is out of the barn. The kids are watching porn at age four and five. And if you don't think so, look it up. So what are you gonna do with this stuff? It was effective. We did not hear those cuts. We didn't get the music. Those influences were put off for a couple of years till we got to college. You could argue it was effective. So if you go home today and your daughter's listening to a horrible MP3 and you take her device and erase it because you can't stand what it's saying to her, what will she do? <laughs> Download three more that are worse. Yeah, just to show you. Yeah, and you're never going to know. And I don't care about your programs and your software and your spy programs. The young kids are much better at this than the best tech guy you could hire. And I went through this with my kids. And the tech guys, the honest ones, would say, oh, you can pay me the money, but your kid's going to backdoor this thing in a week. He'll figure it out before I do. It's just the nature of the beast. So what should you do? We suggest, and I learned this in the prisons, you do something called respect-based intervention. Respect-based intervention. Fear kills connections. And when we talk about the seven C's of resilience, you'll see connection is the key. Fear destroys connection. You can get somebody to comply, but they're not going to connect with you. Their mind will not be open to hearing what you have to say because now you're trying to go after the third brain system called the parent brain, and that's where our belief system resides. Morality, ethics, they can be good beliefs, they can be bad beliefs, but that's where our beliefs get entrenched. And these circuits can really run our behavior. When you walk up to the door and an elderly person on a walker is going through the shopping door, do you rush ahead of them or do you step back and hold the door? You step back and hold the door. Do you ponder what's the moral ethical thing to do? No, it's a reflex. So you develop a belief somewhere and it helps guide your life. It helps guide your behavior. Fear does not develop beliefs, okay? Fear does not shape morality or ethics. So what do you do? You try what I tried. Um, my father tried something that really impacted on me, and I said, I think I'm gonna try something different for my kids. So I came home, and my son is in my basement, with his gangster friends listening to his devil's music. And this was circa, I think it was 2002, I forget, right, 2004. And um, how do I know it's devil's music? Because one, it boom, 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 shakes the house. And then if you listen to the lyrics, they're a bit shocking. So I go downstairs and we had that electrical problem where you squeak this basement steps, it shuts off the CD player. Do you ever have that? <laughs> yeah, so remember CDs? So I go downstairs, CD player shuts off, and the boys are all standing there doing nothing. I said, gentlemen, we need to turn that CD player back on. They look at each other. I said, I'm not taking it. 
I don't even want to know whose CD it is. The price you pay is we listen to it together, okay? And they're looking at each other. So, the, you know, I heard an artist said a number of things, I'll spare you. The key part was, he was saying something that I never learned in my Psychology of Women courses, which is women like to be beaten up. You knew that, right? All the females know that. And I know it's true because this artist, this is in 2002 and it's gotten worse, 2004, it's gotten worse, was saying you should beat her up because um, the refrain, I sort of lost it. It's she squeals, she pleads, she begs, she cries when you're beating her, but she loves it, she loves it, she loves it. So what's the message in that? You disregard what women say because you know what they really want. They feel loved. And you know about bitch slapping, right? You know that trend is back again. Girls brag about being bitch slapped. You know, hello Me Too movement. They brag, it's like a red badge of courage. Oh, he was so jealous, he slapped me. And the girls laugh. So things are really frightening out there. So I hear this and I'm thinking, and my dad's ghost pops up and says, punch him in the face, you know? And then you'll, you'll teach him. No, dad, I'm gonna try another way here. So I said to the boys, as a gentleman, do you think that women like to get beaten up, that they feel loved. And of course they said to me, why are you asking us that? I said, well, you're listening to this stuff. You know, I worry, do you think that what you see and what you hear can affect your behavior? Nah. I said, really, I'll be right back. And I had graphs, I was teaching a class back then. You can get this online. I found a graph about the smoking study that I mentioned. So look at this, guys. The best way to get a kid to try smoking cigarettes is to show them lots of on-screen smoking. So like seeing this stuff, you know, in pictures and movies and stuff, that can affect behavior, right? Well, that's just smoking cigarettes, that's stupid. Nothing would make a guy beat up a girl. Really, I'll be right back. I ran back to my study and got another graph. So look at this, not causation, correlation. As these lyrics have gone up, look at the rates of sexual violence against females. Gentlemen, do you think that there's a relationship? Nah, nothing would make anybody beat up a girl. I said, really? Maybe not you, but you know, bitch slapping is happening. Maybe some guy who's angry, he's got a problem. Maybe his father beats him up. Maybe he feels it's okay because he's hearing the stuff in his music. What do you think? Ross hated it when I did this stuff. <laughs> One time he said, why don't you just punch me in the face and get it over with? <laughs> I said, Ross, I'd love to punch you in the face and get it over with. Which I would, that's the truth, that's, you know, that side of me. But I said to the kids, I said, gentlemen, what would it do if I punched Ross in the face, tuned him up in front of his good friends? What would I accomplish? I would enrage and humiliate him. I would push him in the direction of that crazy person on the CD player. I would advance his cause, not mine. I said, gentlemen, it, it just doesn't work. I said, you know, in the army, Number one lesson I learned, never forgot, never start a fight you can't win. So I wish I could win the fight with your culture. I wish taking the CD would do it. But I know this stuff rains on your head as soon as I walk out of the room, it's back there. Guys, I can't win that fight with your culture. I can't toss the room and frighten my son. It ain't going to get this war finished. It's not going to happen. The culture has beaten me. It's through my wire, they're over my wall. We gotta boogie out of here, guys, and figure out another way to win this eventually. Because this ain't working. This is a losing strategy. Gentlemen, I said, I can't control what you see and hear. I care about what you think about what you see and what you hear. And on that note, I've invited Ross's mother downstairs to enlighten us from a female perspective. <laughs> as to whether women enjoy being beaten up. Now they're going, eh, 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 eh. What's the point? <clears throat> Frightening him, tuning him up, taking him stuff, his stuff, what would that have accomplished? The point is to lob thoughts in. And no, you don't get these, oh my God, Mr. Bradley, you're so wise, you know. See, it's not like that, in case you've noticed with kids. It's a war of attrition, it's, you know, step by step. But always think about guerrilla warfare. What's guerrilla warfare? It's not Gettysburg. You know, you run up to your opponent's wall, you lob a hand grenade over and you run the hell away, you know, and you disrupt them. Lob thoughts into the teenage brain. Lob a thought, a concept, a question. 
And it can be, can I ask you, and always ask a question, can I ask you a question? Sure. What would you do, son, if somebody at your, your lunch table uh, was talking about bitch slapping his girlfriend? What would you do? That's a stupid question. I can't be always asking. Okay, son, just to ask you, what would you like for dinner? You pivot. Why do you pivot? You're at the height of your power when you lob in the question, right? And the more you argue and get into the back and forth, you're losing power because now it becomes a football game. Who's going to win the day? Lob in the thought, say, oh, sorry, and back off. And it rolls around in their brains. It does. And they think about it. If you get into a back and forth screamer, how dare you say women like to get beaten, they're just thinking about you screaming. They're not thinking about the issue. Has everybody got this? When they're calm, that adult brain <clears throat> is online and can process. When you've got them frightened or humiliated, embarrassed, ashamed, it's all child brain. You're just talking to a four-year-old. Don't waste your time. If you can't be dispassionate, don't waste your time. If you're personally pissed off, I'm not judging. I get there a lot with my kids just the other yesterday, and I'm, I'm a vet. He got me really wired. I felt myself getting personally angry at what he was talking about. And I had to change the subject. I could feel it. Not a good place. So we switched off to you know, the Eagles drafts or whatever. You know, we'll pick it up next time. So as soon as you find yourself going for the fear stuff, end it. Nothing good will happen. Um, so the questions are the key, guys, not the lectures. It's not the lectures. It's the question. You ask the right question. That kid, even a gangster, will go looking for an answer, either thinking about it, researching it, talking to some other kid. And that's the best learning. That's intrinsic learning that comes from their own motivation to figure out the answer, not hand it to them. Um, OK. Remember, these brain regions, when you're dealing with your kids, and try to keep in mind your target is to try to lob in questions to that adult brain. And anything else is really a waste of time. If you challenge a parent belief, you're also in trouble. If a kid says, yeah, all gay people should be killed, if you go after that directly, uh, say, that's ridiculous, what's wrong with you, good luck with that one. You know, you're, you're in a closed loop system. You don't argue the belief. What you do is you try to pivot and come up with a question, kind of well rehearsed. And you may plan it the next, for the next day that you lob in about that to get the kid to start to look at things from another perspective. Go in and attack people's beliefs head on. Have you watched TV recently? Good luck with that. They entrench. They dig deeper. They get tougher. But lobbying a question, look, you know, can I ask you a question? What do you think about blah, 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 that's done in a respect-based way? And that's the concept we're here to talk about. Respect-based intervention. Seeing that you're a human being, regardless of your history and your past, deserving of respect because you have the potential to be wonderful. And I'm respecting you based on who you are as a human being, not on your behaviors of the past. Those are behaviors, they're not you. I can hate your behaviors. I hate that you beat up that girl. I absolutely do hate that. Sorry. I think you're better than that. I think you can do a whole lot better, because I know you're a better person than that. Separate the behavior from the kid. So let them understand that they are two different things, and they have the choice to change the behavior. So, that brings us to strategies and tactics. And you have a couple of handouts there, and because, again, I've spoken too long, and I want to leave some question time, we will get you out of here at noon on the dot. Um, I'll let you do most of that on your own. One handout is the seven C's of resilience. Those are seven factors, and the other person I steal a lot from is a guy named Ken Ginsberg from the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics. And Ken is a chop in Philadelphia. And he's a great speaker, by the way, if you have the chance to get him out. And um, he came up with seven, in, in addition to a huge study that was done, those seven factors that you're looking at 
that are assets and skills, as you'll see, that build resilience. And as you scan those, if you think about the two vets I talked about and their response to horrendous trauma, doesn't it all play in? Doesn't it all start to come together? The first vet was isolated, did not have a good life beforehand, um, was not supported, was not successful. He didn't believe in himself. He was not a good candidate to go into the military at all. He was in bad shape, if you will, before he got blown up. The second guy was a guy who had confidence. He was a runner, that's why he went at the runner's prosthetic. He was an Ironman competitor and all that, that craziness. Sorry if I offend anybody, but he loved that challenge stuff. Um, and remember, the first vet wanted to isolate. What about the second vet? He was all about connections. If you scan that list and you ask me, well, you know, what one would you pick above the others as being the most powerful? It would be connections. I think the science says the more we are connected to other human beings, the more resilient we are and the more able we are to respond to terrible trauma that we bounce back to the surface. I think that's key. If you look at the others, if you scan that list, if you find GPA or AP courses or summer enrichment programs, I'll give you a hundred bucks. It ain't there. It ain't there. That's not where resilience comes from. It, I think, I believe, and there's people that argue with me, I think it comes from the opposite. One of the seven C's is indeed competence, and competence is acquiring a set of skills, specific skills of things you can do. You know, I can run a marathon, I can do the rope climb, <clears throat> I can kick a field goal, um, I can be kind to my little brother. Uh, I can mow the lawn. So there are specific skills that are important, you know, tangibles, if you will, where we build assets. But we've gotten carried away with that. We've decided that's the most important C, is competence. You know, hammering AP into these kids and so forth. It ain't. It's the C of, con of connection. And what's that one look like? Well, just, you know, you can scan the things we tell parents and interveners to go after, but it has to do with connecting with other human beings. I had a kid a couple of weeks ago planning their schedule next year, saying, you know, four AP courses, and so you really want to do that. Well, there's other things I'd like to do, but there's no time. What else would you like to do? Well, I love community service. I love tutoring little kids. You know, it's like I get really, like, amazed when, you know, I teach them, you know, a couple of words they didn't know or, you know, to read a sentence. It, it's, like, unbelievable to me. I said, well, Cancel out the AP. Join community service. Can't do that. You know, I, I'm headed for an elite school. Saying, I don't know how to tell you this, but if you're asking me what will help you do better in life, it's a community service. You will learn more than you will in AP physics. Sorry. You will learn more that will be helpful to you. You want to do physics? You can do that in college. Guys, we have safety nets for kids that screw up school. I get a, a letter from Becky a few years ago. Becky was the child, we're in a great school district, and uh, Becky was the product of a courtroom attorney, trial attorney, and I guess a neurologist, parents. And they brought Becky in because she got C's. She was a sweet kid, she was a nice kid, just like, you know, I just don't care about it. My parents are really upset and they wanted me to motivate her. She needs motivation, Dr. Bradley. You know, she's really brilliant. She should be in AP courses and kicking butt. I'll take a shot at it, guys, but, you know, I'll see how it works out. Becky was nice. She was real open. She was saying, I just don't care about that. What do you care about, Becky? Well, I do community service. I work at the soup kitchen. You know, I do this stuff and I just love that stuff. And I said, well, what do you think about, you know, college? She said, well, I know I'm screwing up and I could do better, but I just really don't care. I said, you know, you might pay a price. She said, I know my parents are upset and blah, blah, blah. I said, okay. So I met with the parents after a number of sessions and said, sorry, it's just not your kid. She's not going to West Point. She's not going to make that cut. She's not interested. And, but she's a great young woman, guys. I said, you know, please you know, affirm the good parts of her. She's through, they were disappointed and they 
were upset and they went on to the next shrink. It was going to motivate her. Anyway, last I heard, Becky went to community college, God forbid, community college. Years later, I get a letter from Becky. Dear Dr. Bradley, this is Becky. Remember me? Guess from where I just graduated. NYU, ha, 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 she writes, exclamation point. And she went to community, discovered she was competitive academically, wanted to go to a good school, and transferred. I didn't even know you could do that. It was the first time I heard that. Guys, there's safety nets for that stuff. There is. And a lot of kids, you know, boot high school, they're nice kids. They work on their heart, their character, another C. Character. And then they find purpose and passion. Guys, when kids find their purpose and passion, when we do, get out of the way. <clears throat> you can't stop achievement. Whatever it is. The problem is it may not be the purpose and passion you want <clears throat> as a parent. You don't want to hear about community service. You want to hear about AP physics because you think your kid will be happy. Remember the cop and the neurosurgeon. I've had cops, cops that hated what they did and cops that tell me they got the best job in the world. They wish they made more money, but they just freaking love what they do. And then the neurosurgeon who makes all the money in the world and wants to put a bullet through his brain because he hates what he does. He never stopped to figure out who he was. What do you want, guys? You want a successful, moneyed kid? Or you want a kid that smiles and says, you know, I pretty much freaking love life. I love what I do. I love who I am. Life is good. You have to define what your true mission is before you start executing strategies and tactics. Okay. Um, so, pushing through, I'm going to let you read the other stuff on your own. I do want to get to tactics. So the seven C's are strategies or broad goals. Tactics are day-to-day -day that you can use as teachers and parents to help your kids get through this. And there's, that's the Ten Commandments of Parenting. The, I want to hit the one commandment, which is, uh, thou shalt be as a dispassionate cop unto thy child in adolescence. What are we talking about? We're talking about the difference between punishment and consequences. They are two radically different things. When you leave here today, and you try to race around the jerk to cut you off, and you get pulled over by the cop, and the cop says, sorry, you're getting a ticket, there's two cops that might pull you over. The first one is angry, and he's tired, and he hates what he does, and he's sarcastic, maybe a little threatening, you know, and you're like a real scary person, right, teaching at the high school. <clears throat> and he says, oh yeah, you were uh, in a hurry to uh, get home? Well, you're going to be a lot more late now, lady. <laughs> and he walks away, you see him sipping his coffee and tying you up on purpose. And then he comes back and he throws a ticket in the window. He says, uh, did your gas pedal get stuck, lady? Oh, sorry, that was Toyota's. <laughs> and he walks away. So you get home, what do you say to your partner? Yeah, this guy's crazy, he shouldn't have a gun, I'm writing a letter, you know, this is, there's something wrong with this guy. Did you ever mention that you try to pass somebody when you shouldn't have? No, you're in a rage about the cop, right? So then the next day, you pull the same maneuver, another cop pulls you over, and her delivery's a little different. She says, ma'am, I can see you're late getting to work. I see your bumper sticker. You're a teacher at Quakertown. So I know you're getting late, but ma'am, better you slow down and get there than not get there at all. I'll get you out of here as soon as I can. She comes back, hands you the same ticket. Same point, same fine. And says, ma'am, I get to pick up body parts here you know, every six months. I'd rather not be picking up yours. Please slow down. Hope the rest of your day is better than this. When she walks away, who are you mad at? You all got that? Mad at yourself. Self-anger is the beginning of psychological growth. Getting pissed off at us is like, I want to change that thing. And that's when it works. That's when it takes. Being pissed off at the drill instructor or the parent or the angry cop doesn't change anything. If anything, it makes it worse. It makes the rebellion, the anger, the rage worse. There's no learning. Everybody got that? So think about that dispassionate cop. What's the difference? Punishment is he made stuff up. He humiliated, embarrassed, and put you out, made you more late. You didn't know that was coming. That's how we parent, right? A kid rolls in drunk, and so we make stuff up. Give me your phone, give me your guitar, you're in for a month. They had no idea. What's a consequence? It's a pre-informed 
outcome of behavior. Say, son, we need to talk. If you go into this party, you don't drink, that's great. You earned your privilege for the next sleepover. If you do use drugs, I'm telling you, we can't have that. So you will not be doing sleepovers for three months. Is that fair? Yeah, okay, so he's pre-informed. And if he breaks the rule, what do you do? You don't yell. Save your yelling. Remember, guys, it doesn't do any good. It only does nothing or bad. Then you say, bad break, son. I can smell you're drinking. And you, by the way, you set that for the morning time, <clears throat> not two o'clock in the morning. You set the next day. And you just say, well, we can't do the sleepovers. I can't believe it. You, you're gonna, I won't have friends. I'm not trying to hurt you. But we just had an agreement, right? Because I've explained to you drugs are bad, can't have you doing that stuff. But I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to punish you. I'm trying to keep you alive. So have your friends here. I'll get the movies and the pizza, whatever. Invite your friends here. Well, they won't come here, Dad. Why is that, son? Right? So guys, get the anger out of your intervening with kids. You just step back like the dispassionate cop. Sorry. You know, I'm trying to save your life. I'm trying to help you learn math so you can have a life. I'm not trying to hurt you. You know, I'm trying to help you learn how to behave in institutions. You know, and you read the student handbook, you break the window, man, there's consequences. But you're a good kid, you'll figure it out, but you gotta fix the window, you gotta, you know, do whatever the service is. You gotta pay back the community for what you did. But it's all right, you'll figure it out. Don't pound, let the kid do his own pounding. They're angry because they cost themselves something they wanted. Okay, I'm gonna shut up. Let's get a couple of quarrels and arguments in and then we will cut you loose. Who would like to go first? Do you, if you feel you can do the classroom voice, please do that. Or we could do the microphone if anybody wants to run the mic around the room or uh, what do you think? Well, we'll try a couple, see how it works. Yes, ma'am. A little bit louder. Um, I think that screen time is, is negative as well, but I also think we have a responsibility to teach kids how to manage and limit their own screen time. Yes. So we kind of have to work with that. What is your perspective on that idea? Absolutely. Screens are here to stay. They ain't going away. And the, your mission, your goal is self-regulation. Your mission is not to take the screen away. Your mission is so when you're, if it's your child, when she goes off to college, she's already learned how to shut the thing off to go to sleep at night. How do you get there? It's a series of steps. There's a lot of good online advice. Uh, my short course advice would be, one, you start talking, you start educating. How many hours do you think you put on the screen? She'll say, oh, two hours a day. You say, all right, cool. We can put a timer on. It'll show us how much you do. Next week, let's take a look at it. The next week, it turns out she's 12 hours a day. She goes, oh my God. You say, yeah, it's a lot. Do you think that that's kind of sucking up your time? So again, you're going after beliefs, you're going after adult brain, do you think, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it is a lot. Well, what do you think is appropriate? Well, I, I think I should be you know, like four hours a day. All right, let's try that. And so we'll convene next Friday, see how you do. Next Friday, oh my God. I'm eight hours a day, I'm not four hours a day. Yeah, I heard these things are addictive, which they are, being probably the next DSM. Um, <clears throat> so what do you think we should do? I don't know. Well, do you want me to help you limit screen time? Because if you're doing this in college, you know, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, you know, so we can look at putting timers on, or I'll tell you what, I'll pay you to shut off your device. How's that for cool? If you hand in the device at 10 o'clock at night, get the devices out of the bedrooms, guys. And you pay whatever number they name, pay that number, get them out of the bedroom. So I'll pay you, how about that, for cool? You can make some money. So all you have to do is hand in your device. And if that were any of these work, then you're done. But if they don't, and she keeps pushing it, you keep slowly going to the next level of intrusion. Ultimately, you might get to, sweetie, I'm so worried about this because I can see your grades are suffering. You're exhausted. You've been sick a lot. You're late for school. We can't do this. Um, sometimes you make a contract. Look, if your grades are decent and you're making school on time and things are going cool, I'll stay out of your life. But invariably, the screens take all that away. 
as they go down the addiction hall. So then you say, yeah, I was on your school website. Sweetie, you're missing homeworks and you're being late. I think we're going to have to go to the next step. I think I have to put a timer on your phone. Oh my God, no, it's not forever. It's not forever. We're going to do it for a few weeks and then I'm backing it off. And by the way, I'm going to throw in this reward for you because I know it's hard because I want you to be able to shut it off yourself. And then we'll try it in four weeks and see if you're ready to self-regulate. Do you get the drift? No screaming, no arguing, uh, step by step to try to build a belief that yeah, maybe I am too much on the screen. They have to learn self-regulation. Great question. Next question. Oh my God, I must have overwhelmed them. Yes, ma'am. Nice and loud, please. So they're always unhappy? Well, as a, as a role, yes. Okay. Okay. If, if a kid seems to be always unhappy, and unhappy can be different than mad because I'm not getting my way. It could be, I'm, I'm unhappy because you didn't give me the smartphone I want. Or I'm unhappy because you make me come in at 10 o'clock at night. That's different. That's a protest. But if you feel a sadness in the kid, that's the one to be scared of. If you just feel this loss of life energy, and I think you know what it is. You've met people who are feeling good about life, and you've met people where you know, something's off. You can feel this sadness. You have to check that out. Depression is an epidemic among teenagers, as is anxiety, and I'm sorry, as is suicide behavior. So you got to check it out. So you might say, first of all, I do the three suicide questions with him tonight. Check it out. A lot of these kids, particularly the males, don't tell anybody. Um, even so, I would just say, you know something, man, it seems like you're sad. Do you think we could see a counselor a few times just to check it out? He'll say no, because they don't want shrinks in their lives. And then you might have to say, well, would you just think about it, and we'll talk tomorrow. So just lob it in, leave it. Don't, don't do Gettysburg. It doesn't work. So you lob it and leave it. Next day, what do you think about seeing that shrink? Uh, I don't want to. You ask him, what's your fear? What are you afraid of? Help him identify what his child brain is reacting to. And then maybe he can handle that. He might say, well, you know, I'm afraid it'll be weird. You know, I'll feel weird. Say, cool, thanks for telling me that. Question, feeling weird, is that a horror or is that a frustration or annoyance? What do you mean? Well, name a horror that's happened in the world recently. Well, that guy shot up all the Jewish people in Pittsburgh. There's a horror. Okay, cool. Uh, feeling weird, is that a horror? No, I guess not. So there you're shifting him out of his child brain that thinks it's a horror to feel weird into his adult brain that says, no, I guess not. And then you say, fine, this could help you. So why don't you go one time, two times. If you don't like the guy, you don't have to go back, but just check it out. And I'll check with you tomorrow if you want to do that. Tomorrow, if he's still resistant, say, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you 10 bucks. Spend an hour with a shrink. That's all you got to do. The bribes, I'm not supposed to say bribes, sorry, psychologists, okay. The incentives can help kids get over that anticipatory anxiety. You know, everything becomes a no, a lot of these, when they feel crummy. So you give them a bribe. Sometimes they'll take the 10. It gets them over that anticipatory thing. And then they're on their way to see that shrinks are just people. It's not that big a deal. But take some action. If you're feeling day by day by day, and same teachers, you see your kids' faces all, you see them. And if you see that prolonged sadness, seven to 10 days, where you just see this kid is not where they should be, be careful, check it out. Okay, so let me, let me uh, finish up. What are the overall recommendations for parents and interveners? Uh, first, Stop viewing failure as a disaster. Guys, what did you learn more from, your successes or your failures? For me, it's success. I get together with the old crew and they say, remember you did this thing and that thing, successes? I, say, I did? I really, I don't remember those things. I don't think that was me. But I can tell you about my failures in exquisite detail. I got them right up here. 
Man, they freaking hurt. I keep them right here. Don't do that again. That was stupid. I never want to feel like that. Our failures, I believe, shape us far more than our successes. So don't get upset. Congratulate the gods. Say, great, it's just time to go to work. What did you learn? What do you wish you had done? What would you do differently the next time? Fantastic. Sounds like you got it. Way to go. Well, what if I fail again? Well, that means you're going to get smarter again and smarter again. You look at any athlete. What, what sport do you like? Football. Okay, Carson Wentz. Do you think he went out and did that first out? No. Do you think he made a lot of mistakes? Yes. How did he learn? He looked at the tapes said, damn, I can do that better. I can do that better. And that's how we get good at stuff. So normalize failure for teenagers. You don't say, oh my God. Say, hey, okay, welcome to the club. It's all right, we're going to learn. Next, as I said, focus on the heart. <clears throat> and that has to do with the character, and that builds resilience. And man, once a kid starts to figure out purpose and passion, you're, you're done. Retire. You're finished. Get out of their way. They're going to take off. It's all about purpose and passion. Once we lock that in, life is not that hard, and it becomes good. The sadness goes away. We find something that we're passionate about. Remind your parents, guys, particularly teachers and yourselves, what is your true mission? What's your goal? It is not to be the parent to raise a child to be an Ivy League student. That is not your job. You know what your job is? It's to be the parent of your grandchildren the parent of your grandchildren. Your kids, the ones that won't look at you and they snicker and snide and you're stupid, they are drinking in everything you do and say. They're upstairs listening in, they're watching how you handle conflict with your partner, how do you handle the jerk in the parking lot, how do you handle failure, how do you handle somebody else who's failed, they are drinking it in. At the same time, they despise you and your middle class lifestyle. They are drinking it in. So how do you want to decide what to pass down? This is your legacy. What do you want it to be? Anger, screaming, yelling, hitting, humiliation? Is that what you want? Isolation? What do you want to see this kid doing with his children, your grandchildren, when they're making him crazy? How about things like compassion, acceptance, especially in the face of provocation, what we call love? That's our job, raising parents of grandchildren. The rest is secondary stuff. I'll tell you my two best tricks. One is the deathbed exercise. For some reason, the journals won't publish it. They say it's a depressing topic. Deathbed exercise. Before I go King Kong on my kids back in the day, I would always stop myself and say, Mike, before you freak out because the family room has been trashed again, uh, think, how will you feel on your deathbed as you're reviewing your life about what you're about to do tonight? Got it. Thank you. Go in. Sarah, give me a hug, girl. God, I missed you. Way on the trip, you know, as I'm stumbling through the Chinese food boxes and because mom's away too. You know, I'm so proud of you. I heard you played hurt in that rugby game. She's a rugby player. You know, God, it's so good to see you. And, yeah, do you think you could help me for the 10,000th time to pick up these Chinese food boxes? It helps us remember what's important. Hate to depress you, I've got news for you, you're going to die. And before you die, you may have the chance to review your life. Think about what you want to be looking at. And finally, humor. Guys, humor is the last defense, and a great defense, against madness, chaos, fear. It's trick cops use, soldiers use, and parents of teenagers that are giving them trouble. Humor. It laugh at the madness. It really works. So Cindy and I have a cartoon on the wall at home that we use many times. Still refer to it. Has a middle-aged couple on opposing couches and they're both reading books and the husband lifts his head and says to his wife, you know sweetheart, now that the kids are all in jail, maybe we can take that trip we always planned. <laughs> Good luck out there guys. Thanks for coming. Keep your heads down. Thank you. Thank you. Not a big deal. Thank you.